Welcome to the Great Detectives of Old Time Radio. This is your host, Adam Graham, from more or less the present day. And we are bringing you, in this YouTube video, a week of archive programs from the Great Detectives of Old Time Radio. Now, these were recorded several years ago, are being posted exactly as they were, except I am cutting the opening for all but the first episode to exclude the theme music and as much front matter as I can, and then also cutting down the end to remove some of that contact information. Now, any specific offers or deals offered on the podcast are not actually valid unless they are shown on our current website at greatdetectives.net. This video does contain chapters, so if you don't want to listen to all of the programs in the week, you can skip around the ones that you want to listen to just like the original listeners did. Now it's time for our archive programs. Detectives of Old Time Radio. That's greatdetectives.net. This is your host, Adam Graham, bringing you Monday's offering, which is, as always, an episode of Box 13 from, and this, of course, comes from 1948. Uh, the title we have here, uh, I've got Susie Quits Paper to Work for Dan, kind of gives away a minor plot point, but that's not the main thrust of this story. Uh, this story is one of the more peculiar and, uh, I think, interesting uh, detective uh, shows I've, I've heard on the radio. Uh, and it's got some pretty incredible twists. I, I'm sure you're going to like it. Um, and we're going to get into it in a moment. If you do have any comments on the show, please feel free to email me, box13 at greatdetectives.net. But without any further ado, let's go ahead and get into... Uh, this episode of Box 13. Box 13. With the star of Paramount Pictures, Alan Ladd as Dan Holliday. Box 13. Box 13. Box. Thirteen. Copy, boy. Copy, boy. Hiya, Mr. Holiday. What do you say? Where's that society page, please? Hiya, Holiday. Hiya. Jerk the first paragraph in that Simmons story. Hiya, Sam. How are you? Hiya, Susie. Hiya, Mr. Holiday. What's in box thirteen? You are listening to Box 13, starring Alan Ladd as Dan Holliday. Now for Box 13, starring Alan Ladd as Dan Holliday. Well, here I am again, standing at the want-ad counter of the Star Times, looking for what? An idea for a story. I could have stayed here as a reporter. I could have been searching for facts. Instead, I'm fumbling for fiction. Instead of a blonde, I'm meeting a deadline. Instead of Chanel number no. 5, I'm heading for a snip of printer's ink. Holiday, you're a dope. Mr. Holiday. I... What's that, Susie? I said there's a letter in box 13 for you. It's special. Special? Special delivery. It was mailed only a couple of hours ago. Something like that could be important. Mm, could be. 
Could be adventure. Could be. Could be a a girl. Could be. <laughs> By the way, Susie, how come you're working so late this evening? Oh, my boss asked me to. He's paying me overtime. Time and three quarters. Time and three quarters? Mm-hmm. I held out for double time when he offered me time and a half. Well, what happened? Oh, we effected a compromise. <laughs> Goodbye, Susie. Special delivery, huh? Well, this could be very important. Also, it couldn't. Well, come on, open it up, Holiday. You haven't got all night. I'm in terrible trouble. Please come to room 718 at the Bradford Hotel. Hurry. Signed, Agatha Marsh. Hmm, that sounds urgent. Who are you, young man? What do you want? I'm the man from Box 13. I'm looking for Agatha Marsh. I'm Agatha Marsh. Come in, come in. You're Agatha Marsh? But don't stand there with your mouth open. Never can tell who might be snooping around the hall. Find a chair and sit down. Now, what's your name? Uh, Dan Holliday. Well, Mr. Holliday, I don't believe in drinking or I'd offer you one, but I have got some sauerkraut juice in my thermos bottle. Oh, uh, no, thanks. It's the same. I like you, Mr. Holliday. I liked your ad in the paper. Adventure wanted. We'll go any place, do anything. It was just what I needed. Well, thanks again. Now then, what's your charge? Charge? For helping me, your fee. Oh, that. No charge, Miss Marsh. Are you trying to be chivalrous? No, you see, I'm a writer. I'm looking for ideas. If I get a good idea, I consider I've been well paid. Well, that seems a little silly. Might I ask just what your trouble is? Oh, you don't think a girl my age could get into trouble, do you? Well, you look like a very charming old... Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, lady, oh, lady, let's not beat around the bush. Now, no doubt you want to know a few things about me. Well, that would be very interesting. Yes, well, I live in Muncie, Indiana, alone. I've got a big house and an independent income. Every year I go someplace for a vacation, and this year I came here. Uh, is that all? Isn't that enough? But the letter you wrote me, you said you were in terrible trouble. Well, I am. If anyone ever finds out about this, I don't know what will happen. Finds out about what? Come over here to the closet. I want to show you something. Look, on the floor. Well, that's a dead man lying there. Well, this would make a good opening chapter for a story. Young man goes to help charming old lady who is in terrible trouble. Terrible trouble turns out to be a corpse. Corpse? Here, you wake up, Holiday. This is the real thing. Now, now do you believe me, young man? When did you find him? Just before I wrote you that letter. Before you wrote the letter? Well, that's hours ago. I know, but what could I do? What could you do? Miss Marsh, you could call the police. And get my name in the papers. Have all the folks back in Muncie know there was a dead man in my room? Oh, no. Miss Marsh, listen to me, please. There's a dead man in that closet. There's a law about dead men. We have to notify the police immediately. You can go to jail for hiding a body. Oh, fiddlesticks. But, Miss Marsh, look at this man. He's been shot at close range. There are powder burns on his coat. I know. I examined him before I wrote you. You see, I read all the current detective stories. Detective stories? This isn't a story. This is the real thing. I know. Why don't you try to prove that I did it? With what? A cap pistol? Now, you're a nice person, Miss Marsh, but this is going to be tough. But don't get so excited. A girl my age could kill a man if she wanted to. Um, rub him out, as they say in the murder mysteries. Please, Miss Marsh, be sensible. You've got a murdered man in your closet. Now pick up that phone and call the police right away. Mr. Holliday, in all seriousness, I can't do it. Think of what my lifelong friends would say. Yes, yes, I know it doesn't look I good. I can see the headlines now. Prominent Muncie pioneer woman found with dead body in hotel. Oh, please, Mr. Holliday, help me. Well, I don't know. This is a little out of my department. Just this once, Mr. Holliday. I've never asked for help before. I'm an old woman. Well, all right. What do you want me to do? I want you to help me get rid of the body. Get rid of the body? Now, look, Miss Marsh, you're not serious. You didn't mean that. No, you don't know me. I fully intend to get rid of that body. Okay, go right ahead. It's your course. And you're going to help me. No, no, I'm sorry. Try a bell. And have him snitch to the desk clerk. 
Besides, you advertised for adventure. But this isn't adventure. It's a nightmare. Come on, Miss Marsh. Let me notify the police. Now, there's a broom closet down the hall. That's very interesting. I I just remember, I'm, I'm meeting someone in the lobby. I'd take the body there myself, but I'm not strong enough. Goodbye, Miss Marsh. I'll scream. Go right ahead. The hotel detective will show up. Just the man I'd love to see. And I'll tell him you killed that man. Oh. Now, would you help me? Suppose we get caught. Then you'll help me. Now, wait a minute. You said we. Now, I'll open the door and watch the hall. Uh, Case the joint, as they say in the mysteries. And then you whisk the body into the closet. You're strong. You can do it. Oh, sure. I'm strong, all right. But not in the head. Oh, this can't be happening to you, Holiday. You can't be dragging a body down the hall of the Bradford Hotel. You know better. And as soon as you can get away from this charming but cracked old gal, you're going to talk to the police. Harry, Harry, I'll open the closet door. Put him in right there. Stick him in good. Here we are. I must be crazy. Now back into my room before anybody sees us. Isn't that easy? Easy, she says. Well, I must say you carry out your part very well. What's next in this little scheme of yours, Miss Marsh? Why, don't you know? We have to find out who killed that Michael O'Brien. You know who he is? Well, I do now. I went through his pockets. Frisk him, as they say in the stories. Well, that cuts it. You stay here. I'm going downstairs. Who's that? Just keep cool. I'll handle everything. Oh, I can't believe this. It just can't happen. My name is Kling, Lieutenant Homicide Bureau. Oh, come in. Come in, won't you? I intend to. Holiday, what are you doing here? Hello, Lieutenant. Oh, do you two know each other? Never mind the social chatter. I thought this was some kind of a gag. Now I'm sure of it. Holiday, just what are you trying to dream up? If I told you, Kling, you'd never believe me. Sit down, Lieutenant. Uh, can I get you some sauerkraut juice? Well, I don't mind if... Uh, some what? Sauerkraut juice. Uh, no, thanks. Now, listen, somebody, some crackpot, phoned in a tip that there was a dead man in this room. Why, Lieutenant, how can you say such things? Lieutenant, now listen. You'll be quiet. Miss Marsh, mind if I have a look around? Not at all, not at all. Here's the closet. Hi, then. You can see for yourself, Lieutenant, there's nobody there. Yeah. I got your name from the desk clerk, Miss Marsh. Maybe you better tell me about yourself. I can tell you all about it. I was talking to Miss Marsh. Are you Miss Marsh? Right now, I think I'm dead. You will be if you keep interrupting me. Go ahead, Miss Marsh. Tell me about yourself. Certainly. I live in Muncie, Indiana. I arrived this morning for a two-week vacation. I'm well known back there, and you can find out everything about me if you care to wire. Uh Uh-huh. Uh, how did you happen to meet Mr. Holliday here? Look, Lieutenant, if you'll permit me to tell you... I'm asking the lady. I went to school with his mother. That's what I did. Uh Huh? See. Well, I guess it was the work of some would-be comic. But I had to investigate it just the same. Well, of course you do. Oh, but Kling, listen. Goodbye, Miss Marsh. So long, Holiday. But Kling, wait. I want to go with you. Why don't you two have a fast game of hearts? Mr. Holiday, wasn't that thrilling? Just like in the magazines. Miss Marsh, you're going to stay in this room until I get Kling back here. Oh, no, no, no. I want to solve this case myself. I wonder how Kling found out that... Miss Marsh. Yes. I'm not the suspicious type, you understand, but a little bird, a a tiny little bird, has intimated that perhaps you might know who tipped off the lieutenant. Of course I know. It was I. What in the world are you doing? I made the call from the corner drugstore a little while ago. I wanted to throw the lieutenant off the trail, like they say. You know what I say? No, what? You're going down to police headquarters and tell the truth. Oh, just a second. Excuse me, please. Yes? Yes, this is Miss Marsh. Oh, you did. I thought so. Yeah, you should have had 817 instead of this room. Oh, no, don't bother. I like it here. I knew it. I knew it all the time. What did you know? That was the room clerk. He got my reservation mixed up. I was supposed to get 817, and I got 718 instead. 
You mean the person who killed Michael O'Brien wanted to get back in here to remove the body? No, no, it doesn't sound reasonable. No, it doesn't. Well, guess who was supposed to get this room? Never mind, we're going to police headquarters. It was Tony Bascari. Tony Bascari? He's the biggest racketeer in town. He's dynamite. Miss Marsh, he's deadly. I know, Mr. Holliday, and I love it. Oh, no. You are listening to Box 13, starring Alan Ladd as Dan Holliday. Now back to Box 13, starring Alan Ladd as Dan Holliday. Two o'clock in the morning, and I can't go to sleep. Oh, that little old girl has me worried to death. She wouldn't go to the police headquarters, and when I went down and talked to Kling, he acted as though it were a big joke and sent me on my way. Hello. This is Agatha Marsh. Now what? Where are you? At the hotel. I went up to see Tony Basquet. You what? Miss Marsh, don't you know that's the worst thing you could have done? I had to talk with him. I put the heat on him, as they say in the murder mysteries. And you're still alive? I accused him of killing that O'Brien man. I came right out with it. But, of course, he wouldn't admit a thing. What do you expect him to do, break down and confess? Well, I think I've got him on the run. But I'm worried. Well, if I had Tony Bascari on the run, I'd be worried, too. Because when I came back, I discovered someone had searched my room. Will you call the police? You should have done it a long time ago. Oh, no, 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 I couldn't. I want you to come over right away. At two in the morning? Mr. Holliday, someone's trying my door. Hang up quick. Call the room clerk. But, Mr. Holliday, I'd... Hurry, I said. That dear little meddlesome old fool. In your clothes, Holliday, because here we go again. And don't forget your boy Scott badge. You'll make the Beaver Patrol tonight. The clerk said she hadn't called the desk. I wonder... No, she would have screamed. Someone would have heard her. It's open. Cleaned out completely. No Miss Marsh, no clothes, no nothing. Not even a piece of note paper. Hey, what's this? Paper airplane. Like the ones I used to make in school. But why should she be making paper airplanes? Airplanes. The airport, that's where they took her. Keep that motor running, I'll be right back. Not many people around this hour of the night. Oh, there she is. And the man with her has his hand in his pocket, and I don't think it's there because it's cold. What I need now is a little fast talk and a little faster action. Okay, I'll take over from here. Uh, who are you? What are you talking about? The old doll. Fast Gary wants it back. Fast Gary told me to put her on a plane. I'm doing it. Yeah? Changed his mind. He wants it back. I don't think so. Besides, I never saw you before. I tell you, if you don't turn her over, Bass Gary might get sore. Why didn't he call me? It's only a half hour ago. I was still at the hotel. He could have called. And spilled everything over our phone. You nuts? This don't sound right. Yeah, forget it. Taking the old doll back with me. Wait a minute. I'm gonna call Tony first. Go ahead, stupid. Get your ears burned off. Who are you calling, stupid? Show me something that'll prove Tony sent you. Got a match? Stop stalling. This is a gun in my pocket. Let's talk to Tony. Yeah, I, I've got some matches here. Thanks. Here. Oh! Get him, Mr. Holiday, quick. Okay. Oh, not so fast. Oh, I, I'm not as young as I used to be. You should have remembered that before you got mixed up in this. Come on, get in. Oh, Driver, get out of here fast. What did you do to that guy anyway? I, I stuck him with my hat pin. I might have guessed it. Now, 
Miss Marsh, what happened at the hotel? Well, I hung up when I heard him trying the door, but I was too late. The door was unlocked. So it was Tony Basquiat, huh? He wanted you out of town fast. Oh, but they were very nice to me. You can thank your lucky stars for that. Usually, Basquiat's enemies wind up in some ditch. I didn't see him again. That man, the one you knocked out at the airport, he was the one who came in my room. Well, you must have that goods on Basquiat. You must have killed this man or had him killed. But why didn't he take him out of the hotel right away? But there was a convention there last night. The whole place was literally crawling with people. Oh, that's the reason. Oh, that paper airplane. That was fast thinking, Miss Marsh. Oh, well, thank you. <laughs> well, now we can go back to Basquiat. We've got the goods on him. We can crack the cakes like they say in the murder mysteries. Miss Marsh, I've got news for you. We're not going to see Basquiat. We're not? Well, where are we going? You'll hate me, I know, but it's the police station. Well, Holiday, what happens now? You've taken Miss Marsh to Kling's office. She looks at him. He nods her into his private office. And suddenly she comes out smiling. You try to leave, only Kling stops you. You stay here, Holiday. Kling, you can't let her walk the streets alone. Vascari will get her. Forget it. I got a man telling you. Okay, okay, but what happened in that office? What did she tell you? Plenty, my friend. She preferred charges against you. She preferred charges against me? Now, what are you talking about? Kidnapping. I kidnapped her? You took her off the plane by force, didn't you? Listen, Kling, that little old lady is a whodunit happy. She'll get herself killed. There really was a body in the hotel, you know. Look, Holiday, do you know what you're saying? Sure, I know what I'm saying. There really was a body in that hotel. Holiday, why didn't you tell me? I tried to, twice. Once in the room and the last time when I came in here. Now think, Holiday, carefully. Where is the body? In a broom closet down the hall. I put it there. You put it there? Yes, I put it there. Holiday, get out of here. <laughs> Well, Holiday, now you're fixed. Even Kling looked at you like those things in your belfry weren't bats. They're more like eagles. But you're in it now, so you've got to follow through. And that indicates a fast ride over to the Bradford Hotel. Oh, clerk. Hey, clerk. Uh, yes? I'd like to find out who occupied Agatha Marsh's room the day before she did. Uh, that question is highly irregular. Oh? Then here's a $10 bill that's highly regular. Oh, <clears throat> uh, let me think. Uh, she has 718. She checked in day before yesterday. Yes? The man who had the room before that was a traveling salesman in uh, lady suits, I believe. Uh, must have cut quite a figure. She must be in this hotel someplace. Her room's empty, but she must be around. But where? What are you worrying about, Holiday? You couldn't wait to get rid of her. Now you can't wait to get her back. Oh, you're a character who belongs back in the Middle Ages with a tin union suit for cold nights. Yeah, she'll probably show up safely with that detective tailing her. The broom closet. Wonder if the dead man is still in there. He must be. Kling hasn't showed up yet. Oh, oh, oh hello, Mr. Holiday. Miss Marsh, what happened? How'd you get in that closet? Isn't this thrilling? No, it isn't. There was a detective trailing me, but he was knocked unconscious. Shocked, as they say in the murder mysteries. And you were brought up here? By the same man who tried to put me on the plane. He hit the detective, put me in the car, and brought me here. Well, you two, what are we playing now? And where is the man I put on you, Miss Marsh? He was hit over the head, Lieutenant, but I'm sure he's all right now. This is the closet where you said the body was? Was, is right, Lieutenant. Yeah, let me take a look. You know what I think, Holiday? What? I think both of you crackpots are making this all up. I don't believe there ever was a body. Kling, you have my word for it. Your word doesn't mean as much as a Chinese dollar. Kling, listen. They brought her back here, locked her up. They took the body away, didn't they, Miss Marsh? Probably going to sink it in cement, as they say in the murder mysteries. Vascari's in his room, I'll bet. Go up and talk to him. Surely, put the heat on him. Just once more, I'll play with you kiddies. Come along. Where? Miss Marsh's room. I'm locking you pixies in till I get to the bottom of this. Well, 
Something's been gone 15 minutes. I wonder what's happening up there. Not much. I haven't heard any shooting. No, that's... I haven't heard any... In that case, how could a man be shot here and that shot not be heard? Oh, it's very easy, Mr. Holliday. The, the killer would use this. Oh, Miss Marsh, now, where'd you get that gun? Just took it out of the drawer. It was here all the time. Well, put it down until Kling returns. But I just want to show you why the shot wouldn't be heard. What do you mean? Will you excuse me, please? This bath towel, Mr. Holliday? Yes, what about it? Well, a smart person would take the gun like this, wrap the bath towel around it like this. You know, Miss March, you found out a lot since you came here. Oh, yes, I've done all right since early this morning. Early this morning? But the clerk said... I talked to Tony Biscari and he said... Paint, look out! Give Miss March for me that paint. You shouldn't have moved, Mr. Holliday. I was really shooting at you. What's this all about, Holliday? What was she doing with that gun in her hand? She was going to kill me, just like she killed Michael O'Brien. That little old lady killing somebody? Miss March, you, you did kill him, didn't you? And you called me, and you got Kling to come up here and catch me dragging the body away. Only he came a little late, as usual. Now, wait a minute, Holiday. Then when you couldn't pin it on me, you tried to hang it on Tony Biscari. Now, what did you do with the body? Dragged it back to the closet in this room. Oh. And I suppose you sat the detective who followed you, too. It was easy. I got him to turn around and hit him over the head with my purse. Why did you kill Michael O'Brien? Did you have something against him? No, no. I never saw him before. Then why kill a perfect stranger? I saw a play once. I liked those ladies in that play. They killed lots of people. I wanted to also. Only I should have done it like the ladies. You don't mean arsenic and old lace. Yes, and I should have worn the lace and given you the arsenic. Well, Holiday, you're back in your apartment again. The sun is shining through the window, a sun you might never have seen again. You know, I've got an idea for you, Holiday. Give up this business and go into something quiet, like night watchman in a cemetery. Holiday. Uh, well, what's that, Clint? They examined the old girl down at the psychopathic ward of the city hospital. She's batty as a loon. You're telling me. I saw that in her eyes when she wrapped the towel around that gun. But, uh... What happened to Bascari and his stooge? When she heard he was in the room above, she tried to pin the body on him. Oh, so he tried to get her out of town in self-defense. Mm. Holiday, you're a very lucky, lucky guy. You can say that again and again. And again. Oh, just a minute. Hello, Mr. Holiday. Susie, what are you doing up here in my apartment? Why aren't you down at the Star Times? Well, my boss and I have been talking about another compromise. Another one? He wants to fire me, and I want to quit. Oh, but Susie, if you left the paper, what would I do for my mail? I was thinking, maybe you'd like to hire a good combination stenographer and secretary, huh? That's you? That's me. Well, I don't know, Susie, but as they say in murder mysteries, I'll have to think it over. You better think fast. Good help is hard to find. Goodbye, Susie. Next week, same time, Alan Ladd stars as Dan Holliday in Box 13. Alan Ladd appears through the courtesy of Paramount Pictures and may currently be seen in Wild Harvest. Box 13 is written and directed by Ted Hediger. Original music was composed and conducted by Rody Schrager. This is a Mayfair production. Welcome back. Wow, we have, we've got one of the most uh, in, uh, crazy characters to show up uh, in uh, a radio drama ever. Wow. Just absolutely incredible. Would not have guessed that ending when I was listening to it uh, for the first time. And, of course, a, a change here that uh, Susie leaving the paper. Uh, so 
uh, Dan is no longer limited to um, teasing her uh, twice an episode. Now it's a much more open time as she's going to be working for him. So uh, apparently that's part of the benefits package. Boise Auto, this is your host, Adam Graham, coming to you with another Tuesday edition of Pat Novak for Hire. Um, I don't have a whole lot to say before we get into today's episode. Just feel free to check out the show notes site, greatdetectives.net. Uh, got any comments, feel free to email me, box13 at greatdetectives.net. Uh, but uh, we're going to get into uh, today's episode now. Uh, this is called Don't Tell Hilda. Uh, in other places, it's known as the Marsha Halpern episode. We will listen and then we'll come back. Ladies and gentlemen. The American Broadcasting Company brings to its entire network one of radio's most unusual programs. Pat Novak for hire. out in front of my office reads that way. Pat Novak for hire. Oh, there's no way to dress it up. If you're in business down on the San Francisco waterfront, everything but murder is a parlor trick. If you rob a few graves, you can pay the rent. And nobody cares if you got sore eyelids. You get that way from winking at too many things. Oh, it's a good living if you don't run short of bail bonds and benzedrine. I discovered that Friday night... After the fight broadcast, I wound up in a little whiskey barrel on Powell Street. I had a Glasgow farmer out of the red when they closed the bar, and I drifted across the street for a cup of coffee. When I came out, it was raining, and the street was deserted. I stood in the doorway and watched the dull neons through the rain. They looked splotched and dim, like watercolors rubbed with a damp rag. It was beginning to rain harder, and... I started out of the doorway when she ducked in and bumped up against me. Oh. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, just wait for your blockers on the next one. I guess I bumped into you. Don't go out on a limb. I'm very sorry. I guess I didn't know where I was going. You seem to be headed in the right direction. How do you mean? Forget I noticed. It's raining awfully hard. Hmm. I wonder if you ever noticed how... When it rains, you feel lonely and lost? Yes. Yes, that's it. How when it rains, you feel lonely and lost. Yeah, well, we're both great readers, so if you'll let me get by, I want to get a cab. Yes, I... I wonder if I could ask you something funny. The bars are closed. No, I... I meant coffee. I'll pay for it. All right. In here? Sure. Come on. The counter will do. All right. What's it going to be? Hey, you back again? Yeah, two coffees. How come? I'm nervous. Two coffees. You like a bear claw, maybe? You know what we want? Two coffees? Yeah. Be right with you. Thank you. I know it's funny asking you in here, but... I have to talk to someone. I don't know what I'm doing. I won't argue. I've been away a long time. I guess a long time. Yeah, the kids will be glad to see you back. Huh? Stop it, will you, sis? Get to the point. Put the show on the road. I think I've lost my memory. At least it seems that way at first. Who are you? I don't know. I suppose you don't believe it. No, but I convince hard. Here you are. Two coffees. Everything all right? Yeah, yeah, everything's fine. I'll be down here if you need anything else. You thought up a name yet, Buster? You'd be crazy to believe me. I guess you'd be crazy, but... I can't remember anything now, look, lady, if you got amnesia, see the police. But you don't believe me. I don't know. Maybe you are leveling. But if you're off your rocker, go to the police. But suppose... Suppose there's something that happened before and the police would be looking for me. 
Please, would you try to help me? How bad are you? Do you know what town you're in? Yes. Have you been here before? Do you live here? I think maybe. Seems like a place I've been. All right, I'll put you in a cab. You go see the police. No. I feel funny. I, I think I'll go outside for a minute. I don't want Hilda to know. Please, I'm, I'm going to... Oh, please, help me. Mister, your girlfriend's on the floor. Yeah, any suggestions? No, she's your date. All right, here, give me a hand, will you? Well, where are you going to take her? The hospital. She's an amnesia case. I hope your memory's good. Huh? You'll need it for answers. Your girlfriend's passed out for good. Don't tell me. I feel a pulse, mister. You're going to have to start over because she's all used up. Well, that's good. You got a wailing wall? Sure. Use the counter while I call homicide. <laughs> It didn't take 2020 vision to see I was in trouble. Maybe it was an accident, maybe it wasn't. I didn't have any idea why she keeled over there, but with a figure like hers, I knew it wasn't old age. That call to homicide meant Hellman was going to be in the picture soon, and then I'd stand about as much chance as a cornfield in a stone quarry. Well, I went through the girl's stuff. She had no identification. There were a couple of snapshots of her, but no name. I told the waiter my name and where Hellman could find me. Then I got out of there. I looked up Jocko Madigan, an ex-doctor who liked his booze pretty well. Smart guy, but he used a mason jar for a jigger. I finally found him holed up in some after-hours joint on Geary Street. He was talkative. Hello, Patsy. A small jug for Mr. Novak, waiter. I want to talk to you, Jocko. Patsy, you shouldn't be here. It's after-hours. Yeah, look, Jocko, I need some help. What do you know about amnesia? Oh, a temporary blessing. Uh, I thought I had it myself once. Oh, stop it, will you? But it just turned out to be a case of bad bourbon, uh, a peasant's drink, I've decided. Get up the street level long enough for me to talk. I'm in trouble. Yes? I met some blister tonight who took a dive after one cup of coffee. Oh, I see. She had amnesia, or she thinks she did. Oh, well, she's dead. Why worry about amnesia? <laughs> it's a minor ailment. Because Hellman's going to think I had something to do with it. She picked out my lap. Don't you see how it's going to add up? I have high hopes. i got to do something in a hurry. Uh, was she a nice girl? Yes, I guess so. How come you met her? Oh, what difference does it make? Tell me about amnesia. Could she phony it? Maybe. Not for long. What makes you think she did? I don't know. She acted like a butterfly with a jag on, and she headed straight for me. It just doesn't add. No. What cell block can I find you in? You can get off your spine and go to work for me. You know the hospital circuit. Hit them all and find out everything you can about recent amnesia cases. Well, how far back do I go? Until you find one that jibes with this girl. Oh, it's impossible. Where do I start? I feel like Noah when they told him to beat the flood. She's blonde, blue eyes, expensive clothes. How big? Just the right size for a good dream. Start checking now and give me a ring at my place. No identification? Uh, none. She only said one thing when she fell. Oh, something crude? No, she mentioned a gal by the name of Hilda. That should be easy to trace. Sure. Just look it up in the phone book. You will find it uh, somewhere between Hellman and Homicide. Right, lover? Well, there wasn't anything I could do for the next few hours except sublet from an ostrich. I had to keep undercover because all I had to work on was a couple of snapshots and a girl named Hilda. Neither figured to get me out of this mess. Hellman was bound to ask a lot of questions because I had as much business being with a dead girl as Lucky Luciano in a finishing school. After I left Jocko, I took a C car downtown and I went home to grab some sleep. When I walked in the apartment, the lights were out, but that didn't make any difference. Hellman's badge was shining like a lake in Ireland. He was making himself at home with my ice cubes. Hello, Novak. Put the light on so I can watch you turn pale. All right, Hellman, get to the point. Sure. Who was your girlfriend? I don't know. She was the coy type. So are you, Novak. You're going to look good sucking your thumb in the gas chamber. I suppose your coroner is full of good news. She died of an overdose of sleeping pills. The coroner's report is murder. How about the space mark suicide? No dice. You don't take sleeping pills, then tour the town for a spot to take a nap. So she died in a coffee joint. What am I supposed to do, carry a stomach pump? You're supposed to tell me who she is. We'll go from there. I don't know, neither did she. 
I've got that down as a lie. You file it any way you want, Hellman. She was amnesia. So are you, Novak. All right, hire a medium then. I told you. She came into the restaurant a total stranger. We got social, but she died a total stranger. How are you going to prove it? I don't know. If I know who she was, I wouldn't play footsie with you. Do I have to draw a map? She came in trying to sort out her marbles and never got there. I see. What did you find out? How about clothes markings? That's your department. How about laundry marks? I don't know. I guess she washed her own. Look, Novak, you're a big boy now. You're in a spot. If you want to help, now's the time to do it. You got everything I know. From here on, you work the ball downfield. All right. You just answer the doorbell from time to time. When you see a guy grinning out there, that'll be me coming to pinch you for murder. Well, that'll take lots of doing, mister, and lots of proof. You remember that. I'll try, Novak. But I may get amnesia. Good night, big shot. <laughs> When Hellman left, I backed into my headache and went to bed. Oh, sure, I was in a spot now. The scorecard said murder, and I was the medalist on the first round. If the police didn't know who she was, that meant she had no record we could work on. I still had the funny hunch about that gal pulling a phony. But if it was phony, I was worse off. I had all the best arrows in town pointing to me, and once Hellman began to build a case, I could throw away those vacation folders... I slept until about nine. The phone began to ring, and I rolled over, expecting to hear Gabriel on the other end of the line. It was just Jocko. Hello, Novak talking. This is Jocko. I've been working all night. We'll build a monument later. What'd you find out? The morning paper says the girl was murdered. Yeah, Hellman gave me a preview. What'd you find out at the hospitals? I've got a complete list of amnesia victims. I know more lost souls than a Hong Kong bartender. Yeah. Most of them are men. Trying to get away from the little woman. Well, you're a big help, Jocko. Don't hang up till you hear about the girl. Go ahead. Nothing on file for the last eight years. In 1941, a 17-year-old girl walked out of California General Hospital. She hasn't been heard of since. How's the description? Oh, it fits like last year's bathing suit. She was Marcia Halpern, the daughter of Emery Halpern. Yeah? Who's he? A pocket-heavy guy down on Montgomery Street. Well, I'll get right down there. Thanks, Jocko. You saved my life. Well, I hadn't intended to go that far. See you later. Well, it was my one chance, even if the odds looked bad. I called up Halpern's office. He said he wasn't in to try him at home. It was listed for a place up on Pacific Heights, so I took a cab over there. When I walked in the lobby, I could tell old man Halpern was making as much money as you can without your own printing press. The apartment made Buckingham Palace look like something George had picked up at a fire sale. The doorman was a sober-looking specimen, the kind of guy that breathes every other Tuesday. He gave me the fish eye as I went up the elevator to the third floor. Halpern's apartment was at the east end. The butler showed me in, and I waited in the living room. It was a real cozy place about the size of a small rugby field. A door opened on the side and 200 pounds of Regency oozed into the room like a wet ghost. Good morning. I'm Mr. Taylor. I'm Novak. Where's Halpern? Well, Mr. Halpern is away on a business trip. I'm Mark Taylor, the family lawyer. <laughs> I believe that's the phrase. Oh. Well, I'll drop by later, huh? Uh, perhaps I can help you. I take care of most of Mr. Halpern's business now. Did you know his daughter? Uh, yes, yes. It was quite tragic. That's what I hear. She was a victim of amnesia. She forgot all the details of her home. Must have been a temptation. Did the police ever do anything on her? Well, the police were not advised. Mr. Halpin hired private detectives, but she was never found. Yes, it was quite tragic. You wear your mourning a long way, Taylor. She'd be about 25 now, wouldn't she? Taffy hair, blue eyes, nice figure. I believe she had leanings in that direction. Why, Mr. Novak? I think I may know where she is. You... Don't know what that would mean to this family, Mr. Novak. You don't know what it would mean to me, Mr. Taylor. Here's a snapshot. Yeah, let me see it. Well, Taylor, this is not a B movie. This is a picture of Marsha Halpern. You sure? I don't make many mistakes, Mr. Novak. All right, if you've used up your quota. She's downtown. I'll get in touch with Mr. Halpern right away. No, take your time. She's dead. She... When? Last night, she got sleepy. What? Yeah, that's right. Somebody gave her enough sleeping pills to stock a drugstore. I see. After all these years, to 
come back. And then this. Uh, it was most... Most tragic? Yes, yes, I was about to say that. It'll be a great blow to Mr. Halpin. It'll be a very great blow to Mr. Halpin. Have the police any ideas? A few. Do you know anybody named Hilda? No, why? No, just sweeping out the corners. When's Halpern due? This afternoon. I'll arrange it. A... Excuse me, please. All right. Hello, this is Mark Taylor. No, that can't be right. Well, when did it happen? Uh, yes. Yes, please keep me advised. You ought to wear a purple suit, Taylor. I have bad news, Mr. Novak. Brace yourself. I'm lightheaded. Go ahead. Mr. Halpern was killed in a motor accident last night. His car plunged down a ravine near Sacramento. Mm -hmm. That's very strange. Yeah. That must have been a great blow to Mr. Halpern. Well, I left there and went downstairs. All the way down, I had the funny feeling that something was wrong. The way a person feels when he goes into a doctor's office with an incurable disease. It may have been Taylor. I don't know. He seemed all right, but I still had that feeling that something was out of place, like a broken line in a perfect picture. I crossed the street and called Hellman. It was too early in the day because he was as sad as a tap dancer in moccasins. Hellman talking. This is Novak. How's the case? You look better every minute. How's the identification? So far, we know she's a woman. That's right. Her name's Marcia Halpern. She disappeared in 1941 with amnesia. San Francisco? Yeah. She's the daughter of Emery Halpern. Right, we'll check with old man Halpern. You better send your best man because he rolled a car and killed himself last night. Where? Sacramento. I got news for you, too. Yeah? We got a statement from that waiter. Who wrote it? He says you brought that girl in for coffee. Also, you were nice and chummy. I knew her for five minutes. With you, that's a lifetime. The guy says you were good friends. That's the way our story's gonna read. You suit yourself. I'm busy. Yeah? Where are you going? Same place you are, Hellman, Sacramento. If I didn't move fast, I was deader than a Philadelphia nightclub. When they start taking statements, you can wire for flowers. I called Jocko and told him to check up on old man Halpern's estate. I borrowed a car and drove up to Sacramento. The accident was just outside of there. When I got to the spot, Hellman was already in charge. He's going to make a fight for the job at last judgment. They were down in the ravine and Hellman was beating around the bushes making more noise than a Venetian blind in a typhoon. Hello, Hellman. Did you find anything? Get your own haystack. I'm busy. Where's the body? You get the blues if you don't see one corpse today. He's up in town. Did you notice those tracks up there in the road? Yeah. Double tracks don't mean a thing. Oh, sure. Maybe two cars fell down and one got lost. Wake up, Hellman. If he drove over the side, he sure had a tough time making up his mind. When you're through on that pipe, I'll send over another. I'm going over to the car. Hellman went over to the car and I started looking through the bushes. I don't know what I expected to find. Maybe an old boy scout. After about ten minutes, I shifted over to the other side, and it showed up right near the ground under a bush. Hellman must have seen me because he came right over. Hey, what is it? What'd you find? A handkerchief. Oh. Hmm. That's funny. What's funny about it, so it's a handkerchief. The old man had a nose, didn't he? Well, he must have loved it then. His hanky's loaded with perfume. Take a whiff here. Yeah. Recognize it? Sure. I don't know about you, but I smell a rat. <laughs> Things began to move. This was the first break, and Hellman knew it. I went back to town, and I tried to get in touch with Jocko, but he was running up a tab somewhere, so I drove over to see Mark Taylor again. When I got to the apartment, I found out he wasn't in, but the pinch hitter was all right. When she opened the door, I got a nice warm feeling, like a melted cheese sandwich. She was standing there in a dark, silk evening gown. It was strapless, and she had no worries. When she spoke, it was like saying, put another log on the fire. Good evening. Taylor in here? Won't you come in? Sure. Mr. Taylor won't be in for a while. I'm waiting for him myself. I see. I'm Pat Novak. Is it urgent? Anything I can do? If it were, you'd get my vote. Who are you? I'm Hilda Travis. I'm a friend of the family. Which family? Would a drink take off the rough edges, Mr. Novak? It might. Good, I'll make one. 
I brought Taylor a present. How nice. A girdle, maybe? Or am I being catty? No, a handkerchief. This one. Do you like it? Should I? I thought you might want it for a keepsake. I found it in a ditch up in Sacramento about ten feet from Emery Halpern. Poor Emery. Here's your drink. Thanks. Poor Emery. It's full of perfume. You want to smell? That wouldn't do any good. You want to know if it matches my perfume? It's your idea. Go ahead. All right. Now, closer. That's it. See? Yeah. It's early in the evening, Mr. Novak. Don't blow a fuse. I won't until I find out who killed Marcia Halpern. Good luck, for everybody's sake. By the way, the uh, police think you killed her, don't they? Did Taylor brief you? A little. I asked him this morning if he knew a girl named Hilda. He must have forgotten. Yeah, everybody's got amnesia. Just to make things easy, did you kill her? Just to make them hard, did you? I see. Well, just tell Taylor I called. And don't be a savage, Mr. Novak. You haven't finished your drink. And it's raining outside. I'll finish this one. That's good. Sit down beside me here. We'll finish our drinks and pray for a cloudburst. She turned out to be an old-fashioned girl. She had about eight of them before I got out of there. I tried to pump her, but she wouldn't talk about Marcia Halpern. I just became a family friend. After I left, I ducked into a drugstore and started phoning Jocko. I finally caught him at the hunt room. He'd worked his way below the label already. Hello, Patsy. I'm having a wonderful time. Yeah, what'd you find out? I just heard a funny story. It's old. What about Halpern? He barely changed his will after the girl died. The whole estate goes to her. Who's next in line? A fellow named Mark Taylor. That's the new part of the will, drawn up three weeks ago. Good boy, Jocko. So I looked up the dope on Mark Taylor. He's a family friend. It's a new club. Go on. Looks all right. Some funny bank book stuff, though. For instance? Well, he drew 3000 bucks out last month for a Lisbon passage. A girl named Helen Dupre. Maybe she's a foreign cinema discovery. Well, he's no talent, Scout. Meet me down in Homicide in ten minutes, Jocko. If we're lucky, we'll show Hellman something. What? How to draw to an inside straight. Hurry up and don't stop for a bracer. Well, just don't smell my breath. See you soon, Mama. I'd explained everything I could to Hellman when Jocko got there. I went over it for him and sent him out on an errand. He was to meet Hellman and come up to Taylor's apartment. I went on ahead. It was about 11 o'clock when I knocked on the door. Mm, Mr. Novak, so soon. Yeah, I'm coming in. Hello, Taylor. I won't say you're wearing out your welcome, Mr. Novak, but it's getting very thin. You better take time out and pack your bags. Is that nice, Patsy? Because a guy named Hellman wants you for murder. We've been over that once, Mr. Novak. Yeah, but we got a whole new infield this time. Hellman thinks you killed a girl named Helen Dupre. I don't know a girl named Helen Dupre. The bank vouchers say yes. They say you brought her over here six weeks ago. Wait a minute, Patsy. Oh, you made the team too, Angel. They got you all fixed up for old man Halpern's case up in Sacramento. Get out of here, Novak. I left a drink here. Find a bar there. Get out of here. I wouldn't want to jam this gun through your face. Come on in, Hellman. Did you bring him with you? Yeah. Come in here, fella. Is that the girl? Yeah, that's her. Where'd you see her before? Sacramento last night. He's crazy. It's a plant, Mark. Tell him more, Junior. You sure she's the one? Yeah. She was on the road, and I seen her at the car with this old fella. Hang on, lady. The road gets bumpy from here on. My lights were out, so I guess she didn't see me. Take this little guy out of here. I got a story. I seen you hit the old fella, then start the car down the bank. I didn't hit him on the head. I told you that, Mark. Yes, you did. Tell him, Mark. Tell him I was here. How can I when you tipped our mitt? That's right, Taylor. Get out while you can. Tell him I was here, Mark. Well, you little fool, don't you know you told them already? You're a bum guy, Mark. You've been a bum guy all along. I keep my mouth shut. I'll give you a chance to talk. I'll tell you about him, Novak. Shut up, you little half-wit. You're all right on the straightaway, but you're a bad guy on the curves, Mark. Keep still, Angel. But a tin-horned punk like you, I'll talk lost. You'd better say it fast. Yeah. You get any prize in the house, Taylor. Take your choice. Are you working for a living, Hellman? Yep. All right, then, let's go. Yeah. See you downtown, Novak. Is she all right, Jocko? I'm out of practice. Well, Patsy. You like it this way, baby? 
No complaints. I've always gone in first class. I wouldn't like it the other way. Yeah. I could have used a little more time, but I'm not greedy. It's still raining out, Patsy. No, it stopped raining. It's beginning to clear up and over. Come on, Jocko, I'm talking to myself. Well, it seems that Marcia Halpern was dead for years. Somewhere on the other side, a girl named Helen Dupre got the story out of her. She looked a lot like Marcia Halpern, so she waited until after the war and contacted this Mark Taylor. They cooked up a hoax and the pot boiled over. She was supposed to fake amnesia and stumble into the hospital. The pictures in the wallet would be printed. Mark would identify her as Marcia Halpern. The same night they planned to kill the old man the way they did. That way, Helen Dupre and Mark could split the dough. But they figured it wrong. Another girl named Hilda Travers had the story, too. She put the squeeze on Mark, and he blundered. He found out he didn't need a phony Marcia Halpern after all. The new clause in the will gave Mark the dough. So he loaded Helen Dupre with sleeping pills while Hilda gave the old man his last ride. All he had to do was wait for the dough and then split with Hilda. A few things went wrong. Sometimes it only takes one. Helen did her part, but she was no Bernhard. And then at the last minute, she knew something was wrong and mentioned Hilda. I kind of began to wonder when Mark identified that picture so fast. After more than eight years, he identified it immediately. And then... It was that handkerchief. From there in, it was freewheeling. All we had to have was a witness. Oh, that guy from Sacramento? Well, he was some actor that Jocko picked up in the hunt room. Hellman finally cleaned up the mess. Taylor's in the clink. And of course, the girl already picked up her end of the check. Oh, she was nice, too. If you don't mind claw marks. Well, it all worked out, and Hellman's happy, except that actor keeps calling him up for parts. The American Broadcasting Company has just brought you the third of a new series, Pat Novak for Hire, starring Jack Webb. Jack O'Madigan is played by Jack Lewis. Inspector Hellman is played by Raymond Byrne. Music was composed and conducted by Basim Ablam. This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company. Welcome back. Jack O'Madigan was the world's first computer hacker. Even before there were computers. So look at this, what he was able to come up with. He got financial information. Uh, he got access to the will. Um, and all the updated information in it. Um, really an incredible amount of information that it just doesn't seem believable he dug up in public records. Um, you know, that was my pet theory for the first few episodes. You know, that really... Hellman's not really uh, that bad of a guy. He just knows that if he leans on uh, Novak, that Novak will go and get Jocko Madigan involved. And Jocko Madigan will solve the case. Um, but And the other thing that gets me uh, is, okay, we, we have a woman that we presume, uh, that we know, was poisoned. And we're talking to someone who's a suspect in that death. Um what part of the brain says it's a good idea to take a drink from her? I mean, really. <sighs> well, 
I guess it's just like Jocko said during one of his long rants, but I, I forget exactly what. But but it would would apply to this situation. Though to be fair, Jocko would take the drink too. So. From Boise, Idaho, this is your host, Adam Graham, uh, bringing you another exciting episode of Let George Do It, where the episodes are not too exciting to start out with, um, as they're still kind of struggling with perhaps maybe trying to do this as a sitcom. Uh, thankfully, that's not the prevailing settlement, but we, we, we're still in those first few episodes. Um, but we're going to get into uh, today's episode in just a moment. I do want to let you know briefly about our contact information. Check out the show notes site, greatdetectives.net. Uh, got any comments, feel free to email me, box13 at greatdetectives.net. Please cast your vote for the show on Podcast Alley. Uh, but without any further ado, let's go ahead and get into Let George Do It. neighborhood Chevron gas station invites you to Let George Do It, brought to you by the makers of climate-tailored Chevron Supreme Gasoline and RPM Compounded Motor Oil. George do it. That's the slogan George Valentine hung in his office when he got out of the army with an idea and not much money to back it up. When a client shows up with a problem, George is happy. When no client appears, George is still happy. The worry department is handled by his secretary, Claire, and her brother, Sonny. Right now, George is sitting in his office when suddenly he hears a commotion outside. Claire. Hey, Claire, come in here. What's the matter, Mr. Valentine? Oh, what's all that noise about? Well, there's a crowd outside our office building. Really? Oh, I wonder what's wrong. Oh, no, it must be some celebrity. Yeah, there. They're getting autographs. Golly, look at the mob. Well, it must be someone very famous. Maybe it's the president. Or Donald Duck. I'm going downstairs to see. No, Claire, you stay here. That mob will tear you to pieces. I got it. I got his autograph. Sonny. Sonny, look at your shirt. It's in shreds. Oh, what's a little thing like a shirt? I got his autograph. Look, see? Jimmy Jones. Jimmy Jones. Jimmy Jones? Jeepers, don't you even know who he is? <laughs> Wait a minute, don't tell me. Let me guess. I know, he's a fullback for Notre Dame. A player named Jones on the Notre Dame squad? <laughs> oh, no, I know, of course. Jimmy Jones, he's an actor. He plays in cowboy pictures. He's not just an actor. He's a hero. Mr. Valentine, you know Thunderbolt, don't you? <laughs> I, I don't think I've ever had the pleasure. Oh, Thunderbolt's as famous as Jimmy Jones. It's his horse. Did you get his autograph, too? Well, the crowd's practically gone. Yeah, now maybe we can get a little work done in this office. That is, uh, if you feel up to it, Sonny. Uh, I beg your pardon, but I'm looking for George Valentine. Well, you found him. Come right on in. Thanks. You're Mr. Valentine. That's right. Say, haven't we met before? Your face looks awfully familiar. You know, I was just going to say the same thing to you. Your face looks awfully familiar, too. Mr. Valentine, it's Jimmy Jones. You've seen him in the movie. Oh, well, sure, of course. Sonny, is this your hero? Sonny. Sonny. She's petrified. Jimmy Jones. Standing right in front of me. <laughs> He's one of your many fans, Mr. Jones. Well, that's awfully nice of you, Sonny. May I shake your hand? My, my hand? <laughs> this is your hand, Sonny. Come on, put it out. Glad to know you, Sonny. I'll never wash it again. <laughs> And this is Sonny's sister, my secretary, Claire Brooks. How are you, Miss Bragg? Uh-uh, don't shake her hand. Look what it did to Sonny. Oh. <laughs> uh, Mr. Valentine, I've heard about you, and I'm hoping that maybe you can help me. Well, I've never failed anyone yet. Uh, sit down, Mr. Jones. I wish you'd call me Jimmy. Okay, Jimmy. I hope Claire and Sonny won't mind, but <laughs> this matter's a little confidential. It's nothing I'm ashamed of, understand, but I've got to keep it quiet for business reasons. Well, you can trust us, Jimmy. Oh, you've nothing to worry about on that score, Mr. Jones. We won't say a word. I'd die first. <laughs> hey, you see, die first. Now go right ahead. Well, the trouble is the kids like me. Maybe they like me because I like them. I'm crazy about kids, George, and I, I'd never want to disappoint them. I just can't let them down. Well, of course not. Why would you let them down? Maybe you've heard. I, I was raised in an orphanage, the Brookdale Orphanage. And every year, Thunderbolt and I put on a benefit performance for them. 
Naturally, they expect me to be there this year, too. Naturally. And they'll expect to see me riding my horse, Thunderbolt. Naturally. George, Claire, Sonny, you mustn't breathe a word of this to anyone. You, you disappoint kids all over the world. Cross my heart. We promise. Well, go ahead, Jimmy. What's the matter? Well, I'm afraid of horses. <laughs> You're what? Oh, you can't be. Suffering cat. You see, we were shooting a picture and something frightened Thunderbolt. He shied and stumbled. He threw you? That's right, and then he stepped on me. Oh, how awful. Oh, it was an accident. Thunderbolt didn't mean to hurt me, but I was laid up for a long time. After that, I, I just couldn't get up enough nerve to ride him. Or for that matter, to ride any horse. Yeah, but, Jimmy... I know it sounds silly, George. I keep telling myself that, but it doesn't do any good. Oh, sure, sure, I understand. Well, what about your career? Well, since the accident, they have a double who does the riding for me. Oh, I see. If this came out, you'd be through in pictures. Oh, that's not important. Think of the kids. Why, if they found out, they wouldn't believe in anything anymore. Well, that settles it, Jimmy. You can't make a personal appearance at the Brookdale Orphanage this year. You can't take the chance. But, George, those kids are looking forward to it. Your trouble is that you're too sentimental about kids. Now, you have nothing more to worry about, Jimmy. I'm in complete charge. I was hoping you'd say that. I'll tell them you had a nervous breakdown or something. You can send Thunderbolt with one of his trainers. Oh, but they want to see me ride him. The kids will never forgive me. Now, you leave that to me, will you, Jimmy? I'll take care of them. I know just how to handle kids. Mrs. Martin is the superintendent of the orphanage. She's in the play yard with the children now, but I'll get her for you, Mr. Valentine. Oh, thanks, miss. Uh, just tell her it's about Jimmy Jones. I'm sort of... Taking charge of things for us. Oh, you know Jimmy Jones. Yes, of course. Oh, I'd love to have his autograph. Oh, uh, are you anybody? Uh, no, nobody much. <laughs> Will you tell Mrs. Martin we're here? Oh, yes, of course. Just make yourself right at home. I'll only be a minute. Mr. Valentine, what are you going to tell Mrs. Martin? Just that Jimmy's been working too hard and that he can't appear here, that's all. There's nothing to it. Oh, those poor kids. Oh, now, Claire, you're making too much of this. You're as bad as Jimmy. It's ridiculous worrying about a bunch of kids. He's got to protect his career. But he means so much to them. Now, listen, Claire, he can't appear at the benefit, do you understand? Anyway, the kids are more interested in seeing his horse. That's not true. Well, Jimmy can send over some ice cream and cake. That'll get them. Just fill up their stomachs and they'll be happy. Mr. Valentine, how can you be so hard-boiled? I just face facts, that's all. Oh, I'm going to wait outside. Where? I prefer fresh air. Women. Hello? Oh, hello. What's your name? Where oh. do you live? Well, I... How old are you? Well, hey, now, hold everything. Why the third degree, honey? What's the third degree? Do you always talk in questions? What did you say? <laughs> now, wait a minute. Look, we're not getting anywhere this way. My name is George. Never mind the rest. Now, come on. Tell me something about yourself. I've got a pet mouse. Oh, uh -huh. yeah? A white one with a long tail. Really? What's his name? George. George? <laughs> <laughs> what a coincidence. I just named him George. Oh, I see. Well, thank you, honey. That's, that's quite a compliment. Do you know any games? Games? Uh, well, now, let's see. Uh... I used to play some games with my nieces. What are nieces? Uh, what are nieces? Well, uh, nieces are, uh, well, they're, well, they're people. <laughs> I mean, uh, well, I'm their uncle, see? So that makes them my nieces. You get it? I don't have any uncle. Oh, well, that's tough, honey. But I have a brother. Well, wonderful. I always say there's nothing like a brother. Why, that's a million times better than an uncle. Jimmy Jones is my brother. Jimmy Jones? He told all us kids he'd be our big brother. So now we each have a family, don't we? Oh, yeah, sure. Uh, uh, look, honey, uh, how would you like another brother? Could you use two? Someone like, uh, well, like me. Oh, no. You wouldn't like me for a brother? No. I'm going to marry you. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> well, that settles do you want me to teach you a game? A game? Yeah, I'd love it. We could play horsey. Well, that sounds exciting. Uh, what do I do? You get down on the floor on your hands and knees. Do I have to? Well, don't you want to play with me? <laughs> okay, honey, you would. Now what? Now I get on your back. There. Give me up, horsey! All right, here we go. <laughs> Hang on now. Hang on, honey. <laughs> Hard-boiled Mr. Valentine. 
Oh, Claire, uh, we're uh, playing horsey. <laughs> you make a beautiful horse. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Claire, this is the girl I'm going to marry. Oh, congratulations. Mr. Valentine, Mrs. Martin will see you now. She's in her office, if you'll just follow me. Okay, thanks. Bye, honey. Goodbye, George. See you in about 16 years. Don't forget now. Don't forget. <laughs> Cute kid. <laughs> her office is on the other side of the play yard. This way. Please. Oh, uh, Miss, wait a minute. Look, yeah. uh... I won't bother Mrs. Martin. Uh, you give her a message for me, will you? All right. Just tell her that I personally guarantee that Jimmy Jones will be here for the benefit. And furthermore, he'll be on his horse, too. Mr. Valentine, I have Mr. Jones on the phone for you now. Oh, thanks, Claire. Hello, Jimmy. Hello, George. What's on your mind? Now, listen, Jimmy, you can't let those kids down. Why, they believe in you. Why, they think you're their big brother. <laughs> Sounds as though you've been out to the orphanage, George. Well, now, look, you know me, Jimmy. I'm not sentimental or anything like that, but... Well, I can't have her disappointed. She named her mouse after me. Her what? Yeah. It's the first time I've ever had a mouse named after me. George, what are you talking about? Just this. You've got to ride Thunderbolt at the benefit. But, George, I told you, since the accident, every time I see a horse, I shake. What'll that do to the kid? Oh, gosh... You're right, Jimmy. No, we can't let him see you that way. Hey, wait a minute. In the movies, you use a double, don't you? What about him? Oh, I thought of him, but it won't work. He's built like me, but he doesn't look like me. The kids will get wise. Well, then all we have to do is to find a double that looks like you. It's a cinch, Jimmy. Leave it to me. What an office force. What's the matter with you two? All you have to do is to find a man who looks like Jimmy Joe. Well, what was wrong with Red Prescott? His nose turns up and his hair is red. Well, then what about Stanley Burns? Why, he was born on a horse. Yeah, I could see that all right. One leg's bends south and the other bends north. <laughs> what about Mr. Manning? There's a similarity even if his face is a little long. I told you to find someone who looks like Jimmy, not his horse. Oh, well, it's no use, Mr. Valentine. I give up. But it's just a simple little job. Find a man about six feet tall with dark, wavy hair and blue eyes, a nose that's reasonably straight, not too much chin, a Mr. Fellow... Valentine. What's the matter? Don't you realize who you're describing? Sure, Jimmy Jones. Someone else, too. Huh? You. Me? Hey, that's right. Mr. Valentine, you do look like him. I noticed it the first time I met you. Why, you could be brothers. Why, that's terrific. Claire, get Jimmy on the telephone right away. Tell him I found his double. <laughs> found the right person, George? <laughs> I know I found the right person. But is it someone we can trust? Trust? Why, this man is the soul of honor. And what's more, he's got plenty of courage. And a heart of gold. Pure gold. He sounds tremendous. Well, I, I don't like to brag, Jimmy, but uh, if you were to pin me down, I'd say he is tremendous. Who is <laughs> Me. You? Sure. Remember how familiar we look to each other? I look like you. Oh, that's where I saw you. Yeah, of course. <laughs> Well, that's wonderful, George. You don't know how relieved I am. Well, I told you I'd come through with flying colors, Jimmy. Now, be at my office tomorrow morning. Okay. Thanks a million, George. So long, Jimmy. Well, it's all set. See, there ought to be a good fee in this for me. Oh, I'm sure there will be, Mr. Valentine. Gee, but Mr. Valentine, I can hardly wait for the benefit. I can just see you dashing into the arena on Thunderbolt. Yeah, it'll be a big moment, all right. The kids will be clapping and yelling their heads off, and I'll come dashing into the arena riding on... on... Great Caesar's ghost. Mr. Valentine, what is it? What's the matter? I just remembered. What's wrong? I've never been on a horse in my life. <laughs> well, it'll take George a minute or so to figure out what to do in this situation. Meanwhile, I wonder how many of you folks can be sure your cars are ready for winter. In many parts of the West, wherever winter means cold or rain... There'll be an epidemic of car troubles this year. Most folks are driving the same old cars, you see, and they're bound to be a little less reliable simply because they're another year older. So here's a good tip. Drop in at your favorite Chevron gas station and let the Chevron dealer check over your car. He's an expert, and because he's in business for himself, making you a regular customer means a lot to him. So you can bet he'll give your car the best of care. You probably need winter-grade RPM motor oil... Or new windshield wiper blades, a battery may need recharging, or your tires could stand a retread job. Whatever it is, find out now before the weather gets really bad. 
Stop in at your neighborhood Chevron gas station this weekend. Well, George had to find a double for Jimmy Jones, someone who looked like Jimmy and could ride Thunderbolt. It finally dawned on all of them that George himself resembles Jimmy... But then he suddenly remembered that he's never been on a horse in his life. Now it's a few minutes later. Oh, that's fine, Mr. Valentine. That's great. You offered to take his place and you've never even been on a horse. Well, there's nothing to it, Mr. Valentine. I'll teach you how to ride. Sonny, you've, you've seen Thunderbolt, haven't you? Sure, lots of times. Is he very active? Oh, yeah, he's a very spirited animal. Oh, a spirited animal, that's what I thought. You're not getting cold feet. Oh, no, 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 of course not, but... But those kids will expect to see someone who can at least stay on the top side of the horse. You've got nothing to worry about, Mr. Valentine. I'll teach you how to ride. Sonny's really very good. Our grandfather raised horses in the country. My grandfather raised cane in the city. <laughs> Come on, Mr. Valentine. We better get started right away. Oh, now look, Sonny. I, I want to start nice and easy, understand? Oh, sure. Just leave it to me. I'll have you riding like an old cow hen. Come on. Okay. Claire? Yes, Mr. Valentine. Goodbye. Goodbye, Mr. Valentine. Shall I meet you somewhere for dinner? Yeah. Make it Joe's Hamburger Hut. That's the one place in town we can eat standing up. Yes, sir? Something in toys for the young man? Oh, no. Not for me. For him. For him? A toy for the gentleman? Yeah. He wants to... Sonny, not so loud. People are listening. Oh, I'll whisper it. Mr. Valentine wants a... He does? Yeah. Yeah, I just want him to get the feel of it. Oh, I see. Well, very well. Second aisle to the left. Tricycles, scooters, kitty cars, and hobby horses. Hey, you were okay on that hobby horse, Mr. Valentine. Now for your second lesson. Oh, but do you think I'm ready to ride this horse, Sonny? Oh, sure. Okay, then. Boost me up. Okay. There you go. Thanks. Now, put your feet in the stirrups, Mr. Valentine. Like this? Yeah, that's right. Press your knees in. Like this? Yeah, that's good. Now, hold on to the reins with your left hand. That's right. Oh, you look fine, Mr. Valentine. Okay, here we go. getting dizzy. Sonny, I can't see anything. Sonny, help. Stop this merry-go-round. <laughs> oh, he's a beautiful animal, isn't he, Mr. Valentine? Yeah, cute. Very cute. His name's Tornado. Oh, you... How do you do, Tornado? Oh, <laughs> Mr. Valentine, come on down out of the haymow. <laughs> he won't hurt you. Well, Sonny, I, I, I don't think he likes me. Oh, well, now, don't be silly, Mr. Valentine. Come on, get up on him. But do you think I'm ready for a real live horse? Well, the only way we can find out is to try. Come on. Say, he's up awfully high, isn't he? He's no higher than most horses. Well, couldn't I try one of the smaller models first? Like that one over there? Mr. Valentine, that's a Shetland pony. You don't want to ride him. <laughs> Why not? He has a very kind face. Come on, now. Get up on Tornado. All right. Nice Tornado. Stand still, boy. I said, stand still. Sonny, tell him to stand still. It's okay. Just jump up on him. Well, maybe he won't like it. He's used to it. Go ahead, Mr. Valentine. Put one foot in the stirrup and swing the other one over. All right. Here I go. Mr. Valentine, wait. I think I'll make it. But, Mr. Valentine... It's he... all right, Sonny. I'm... Sonny, what's happened to this horse? Where's his head? <laughs> Get down, Mr. Valentine. You put the wrong foot in the stirrup. Oh, is that it? I thought there was something wrong. Now, try it again. Remember, your left foot in the stirrup, your right foot swings over. Oh, it's no use, Sonny. You can't teach an old horse new tricks. He's not old. No, but I am. Come on, now, let's get back to the office. But, Mr. Valentine, what about the benefits? How will you be able to take Mr. Jones's place and ride Thunderbolt? Well, it's no use, Sonny. I can't do it. Jeepers, I wish I could ride Thunderbolt. Well, so do I. I'd like nothing better than to have... Sonny, why not? Huh? Of course. There's our answer. You'll ride Thunderbolt. <laughs> The 
But, George, I don't get it. You do look like me, so why can't you take my place? Why don't you tell him, Mr. Valentine? Now, Claire, I'll handle this in my own way. Jeepers, Mr. Jones, please let me ride Thunderbolt. I can handle him honest. Just ask my sister. Will you keep quiet, Sonny? You see, Jimmy, I'm afraid that someone might catch on that I'm not you. Oh, do you think so? Well, I suppose there'll be reporters there. Yeah, I imagine so. And what if they find out? It'll ruin everything. Oh, please, Mr. Jones. I know Thunderbolt and I'll get along okay. Yes, Sonny's very good with horses. He's been riding since he was a baby. But how can we work it? Sonny certainly doesn't look like me. Well, Jimmy, I got this all figured out. Now, look, it's simple. You walk out and talk to the kids, uh-huh. you know, make a speech. Yeah. Then I imagine they'll begin yelling for Thunderbolt. Oh, you can count on that. Oh, fine, fine. Now then, when that happens, you say you brought Thunderbolt along, all right, but that you'd like to feel like a kid again and sit in the audience with them. Go on, then what happens? Well, then you say, uh, how about one of you kids riding Thunderbolt? Who'd like to try it? Uh-huh. Now then, Sonny is sitting right in the front row. You can't miss him. And when you say, who'd like to ride Thunderbolt, Sonny jumps up and yells, let me, mister, let me. Let me, mister, let me. Yeah, that's the idea. And, Jimmy, no matter how many kids yell, you choose Sonny. Understand? Well, of course. I wouldn't dare take a chance on someone who didn't know horses. Now, how does it sound, Jimmy? It sounds okay, George, but you sure nothing will go wrong? Listen to him. Now, Jimmy, I tell you, it can't miss. Why, what could possibly go wrong? see so many children in all your life, Mr. Valentine? It looks as if all the kids in town are here. All except Sonny. Now, stop worrying about Sonny. He'll show up. But he should be here now. What's happened to him? Well, I know he went to a movie early this afternoon. Then I think he planned to buy some riding boots. Riding boots? I can't save this place for him much longer. Why can't he be on time? Oh, just be patient, Mr. Valentine. But they're getting ready to start the show. Oh, where is that boy? Well, it's not like Sonny to be late. Well, it's your fault, Claire. You should have brought him over with you. That's right. Blame me for it. I always get... Oh, Mr. Valentine, they're going to begin. Here comes Jimmy Jones now. Howdy, kids! Oh, where's that Sonny? Well, I can't imagine what's keeping him. Now, hold it, kids. Hold it. First, I want to tell you how much it means to me to be here again. You know, every year I look forward to my visit to the Brookdale Orphanage because it's just like coming home again for me. Where is he? Where's that Sonny? Hey, what if he doesn't show up? <laughs> but I didn't come here to make a speech. I just wanted to say hello to all my friends, to all my little brothers and sisters. Mr. Valentine, you have to ride Thunderbolt. Oh, that's impossible. I don't even know on which side to get on. Now, is there anything I can do for you, kid? Thunderbolt! Mr. Valentine. Claire, think of something. You can't let one of them ride him. It would be dangerous. Well, it would be dangerous for me, too. Now, take it easy, kid. Take it easy. Take it easy. That's it. Thunderbolt is here, all right, but look, I- I'm sort of tired of riding I want to sit down there with the rest of you, with my friends. Here it comes. How about one of you riding Thunderbolt? Mr. Valentine. Who would like to ride? Mr. Valentine. Come on, who wants to ride Thunderbolt? Mr. Mr. Here's someone who wants to ride Thunderbolt. Go on, George, go on. Claire, Claire, stop pushing me. You've got to go now, George. There's no other way out. Oh, now, Claire. Come on, you've got to do it. What a spot you put me in, George. George. Hello, Jimmy. How do you feel? What's happened to Son? He just didn't show up. But, George, what are we going to do? The kids are waiting. Somebody's got to ride Thunderbolt. George will ride. Now, Claire. I guess you'll have to, George. I'm sorry, Jimmy. I'd like to. Really, I would. But I... Well, I just can't. Now, George. What do you mean? What are you talking about? What's the matter with you, George? Nothing. Except that I've never been on a horse in my life. Oh, I... You've never been on a horse in your life? That's right. Oh, this is a fine time to tell me. What about all these kids? They're waiting. Listen, Jimmy, I'd never be able to get up on them. But, George, them. And if I did get up on them, I'd never be able to stay there. But you said... And if you... I did stay there, I'd die of fright. Oh. <laughs> I ought to wring your neck. Now, that won't help any. So what am I going to do? Well, uh, uh, tell him you just noticed that Thunderbolt is indisposed. Yeah, tell him he has a headache. Who ever heard of a horse with a headache? <laughs> well, he's a very unusual animal. A very... But these kids believe in me. Well, they've been looking forward to this day for months. Then why don't you ride Thunderbolt? Me? Yes, you. All right, I will. Mr. Jones, you can't. I can't let these kids down. I'll ride him if it kills me. Mr. Valentine, stop him. Oh, Mr. Valentine, he's getting up on Thunderbolt. Mr. Valentine. Oh, I can't look. George. George, where are you? Out in the play yard, on the teeter-totter. Oh. Uh, why didn't you stay in the arena? Well, I... I just couldn't take it. But, George, it was all right. Jimmy was magnificent. What happened? He rode Thunderbolt just as though nothing had ever gone wrong. The kids went wild. Yeah, I heard them screaming, but I thought the worst. Jimmy's looking for you. He wants to talk to you. Oh, yeah, I'll bet he does. Come on, let's get out of here. 
But he's anxious to see you. Anxious to break my neck. Oh, now, George. Well, what else would he want to see me for? I was certainly a lot of help to him. Just when he needed me, I... I failed him. Now, George. I suppose you think I'm a coward. Oh, of course not. Oh, that's all right. Go ahead. Don't hold back. Tell me what you think. Well, I think... Please don't say it, Claire. I don't want to hear it. <laughs> this has been a very happy day for me, George. It's a pleasant change to see you this way. What way? I don't get it. Well, you're usually so sure of yourself... But now you're... Well, you're just like a little boy. <laughs> you mean, uh... You mean you'd like to take me in your arms? Well... Well, if you have any kind of an urge, Claire, don't suppress it. It isn't good for you. <laughs> oh, George, you're wonderful. Oh, say that again. Oh, George, you're wonderful. Say that again. Oh, George, you're wonderful. Say that again. Jimmy! Why oh, you talk about acting? Why, your acting makes mine look silly. Acting? Who's acting? <laughs> Why, do you know you really had me convinced that, that you were afraid to ride Thunderbolt? <laughs> and that's just what you wanted me to think, wasn't it, George? Yes, yes. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly what I wanted you to think, all right. <laughs> sure, you had to trick me into riding Thunderbolt. Trick you? You know that once I got on him, I'd get my confidence back and I'd be cured. Oh, yes, of course. That's what I had in mind, all right. George. <laughs> well, it was wonderful psychology, George. I, I don't know how I can thank you. Oh, well, that's all right, Jimmy. Forget it. <laughs> Glad to help you out. George, are you trying to make me believe it was all an act? Oh, of course. What else? Why, I'm crazy about horses. There's nothing I like better than to ride on a really spirited merry-go-round. <laughs> <laughs> I know that, George. But I couldn't let on, even to you, Claire. I was afraid you might give it away. Oh, See? Sure, I had to make the act look good, didn't I, Jimmy? <laughs> Why, of course. <laughs> Why, of course. Uh, will you excuse me now? Mrs. Martin wants to see me. Oh, sure, Jimmy. Go right ahead. But uh, stick around. I have something to show you. So it was all an act, huh? Uh, naturally. Then you really like horses. Like them? Why, I love them. There's nothing I like better than a brisk canter down the bridle path. And to think that I bothered to feel sorry for you. Hey, Mr. Valentine, when does it start? When do I write Thunderbolt? Thunderbolt? What happened to you? Where have you been? Well, I went to see Jimmy Jones and Thunderbolt in their new picture. But, Sonny, that was this morning. Yeah, I know, but it was so good I stayed to see it four times. <laughs> oh, Sonny. Never mind, Sonny. We didn't need you. We got along okay, didn't we, Claire? Hmm. Say, I'll bet I'll be able to get a good fee out of this. How much do you think I can stick him for? You ought to be ashamed to take anything. Oh, listen to her. George. Jo oh, I'm glad you didn't leave. Come with me. I got a little present for you. A present? I was afraid you wouldn't accept any money from me, George. That would be just like him, wouldn't it, Claire? <laughs> How well you know him. <laughs> so I decided to give you something else. Give me something yeah. else? A little present. I think you'll like him, George. Like him? He's a full brother to Thunderbolt. A horse? <laughs> <laughs> of course, he's a little wild yet, but think of the fun you'll have breaking him in. <laughs> Meanwhile, neighborliness, it always seems to me, is as American as hot dogs at a ball game. Most of us can spot it right away and appreciate it, too. It's one reason, I think, why many motorists like to drive into Chevron gas stations. They're all locally run, you know. And since they're home folks, Chevron dealers are mighty accommodating. Every time you stop at a cream green and burgundy station... You know you're trading with a chap who's in business for himself, anxious to please you because his success depends upon it. And there's another point worth remembering. Every Chevron gas station carries RPM compounded motor oil and climate-tailored Chevron Supreme gasoline. They all honor Chevron credit cards, too. So just about everything a motorist looks for, he'll find at those neighborly Chevron gas stations. Try them when you're out for a drive this weekend. Well, next week, George finds himself in the middle of a lot of excitement. You'll probably hear him say something like this. Mr. Valentine. Yes? How are you feeling? Oh, fine. Great. Never felt better. Yeah? Well, enjoy your help while you got it. It won't last. That's all? Get out of town, Mr. Valentine. Mr. Valentine, what was that all about? What was it? The same fellow who's been phoning me right along. He's still worried about my health. <laughs> Oh, 
Chevron gas stations all through the West invite you to be with us again next week for another chapter of Let George Do It, brought to you by the makers of Chevron Supreme Gasoline and RPM Compounded Motor Oil. Let George Do It, starring Robert Bailey as George, with Francis Robinson as Claire, and Eddie Firestone Jr. as Sonny, is written by Pauline Hopkins, produced and directed by Owen Vincent. Others in the cast were Harry Bartell as Jimmy Jones, Nina Clowden as the girl, Anne Whitfield as the child, and Stanley Waxman as the floor walker. The music was composed and conducted by Charles Dent. Your announcer, John Heaston. Listen again next week, same time, same station, to Let George Do It. Broadcasting system. Welcome back. All right. This isn't really what um, I had in mind when I started the show, but I have to say this was actually pretty good. Uh, it was funny and cute and, uh, you know, really, uh, I, you know, stands up as a nice uh, example of old-time radio comedy. Um, so uh, I was pleasantly surprised because I was expecting we, we would have episodes that were just exactly like the um, Cousin Jeff episode. This one, actually, there was some genuine uh, comedy in there. Uh, and you get to see a little bit of... Uh, the kind of the charisma that really made Bob Bailey such a great actor on the radio. Um, but I know uh, people are expecting hard-boiled detective stories from Let George Do It, and we're going to get to that um, very shortly because we're running out of these cutesy stories. That's it for today. We'll be back tomorrow with Sherlock Holmes as he takes a troop of, of London uh, elementary school children to the circus and hilarity ensues. Okay, all right, I'm making that up. Well, this is a, a key episode. As I said, the episodes from the early uh, to mid-1930s are kind of sparse. Um, but we did manage to track down in this episode from 1934. Uh, this episode uh, uh, features a change in personnel. Uh, Sherlock Holmes, for uh, or for more than 100 episodes, actually, was Richard Gordon. Well, this is a new season. Still the same sponsor, but we have a new Sherlock Holmes, uh, the change to Lu uh, Luis Hector. Um, now, Hector, I'll, I'll be honest, is not exactly uh, my favorite Holmes. Um, in fact, he doesn't, yeah, he doesn't seem to have quite the right voice for it, but he's Sherlock Holmes, uh, and we I think we have a total of three Luis Hector uh, shows, maybe four. Um, we'll have to see how things play out. But this episode uh, is not from the Sherlock Holmes canon. It is called the uh, he uh, Hebraic Breastplate. Uh, and by the way, I mentioned the big gap in episodes. Uh, this, The last episode we played was from February of 1933. This one is from November of 1934. Um, so huge gap of episodes. There was actually a point where the show went off the air after June 1933, and our sponsors, uh, George Washington Coffee, explained that. Uh, and for those of you who on the Dragnet podcast uh, complained about no commercials, we're giving you commercials here. So enjoy this. Let's go ahead and get into today's uh, case, the Hebraic Breastplate. Beginning with this broadcast, the makers of G. Washington Coffee will bring you each week at this time a dramatization of one of the famous stories of Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. I don't know how many of our listeners will agree, but for us, this is a red-letter day because it marks the beginning of another series of visits to the comfortable, firelit study of Dr. Watson. 
to hear his hair-raising reminiscences of Sherlock Holmes' adventures, and to drink his delicious G. Washington coffee. Dr. Watson was not with us last winter because he was taking what he called his sabbatical year. It seems that he spent a great deal of that time with a certain travel-worn and battered dispatch box in the vaults of Holton Company, private bankers in Charing Cross. Out of it, he has unearthed papers containing notes on Sherlock Holmes cases which have not been told previously on the air. So now we stroll down the quiet, tree-lined street. Yes, here's the house with its dark curtains. We turn in the neat little path. The familiar door with its brightly polished brass knocker opens to welcome us. And we find ourselves in Dr. Watson's well-remembered study. The easy chairs, the rows of worn books, the kettle steaming cozily on the hearth. Everything just the same. Even the old doctor. Yes. Well, well, well. This is like old times, isn't it, Mr. Bell? Yes, I do. I had no idea how I'd miss these little sessions of ours. But here, what more appropriate way to celebrate our reunion than by preparing a cup of our old favorite G. Washington coffee? That's what I've been looking forward to, Dr. Watson. Ah, I see you have everything ready to make it. Oh, it was very easy. <laughs> The only preparation necessary was to heat the water. Then I'll take the lid off the can. Mm -hmm. A teaspoonful of G. Washington's coffee crystals in your cup. And one in mine. Add the hot water. Yes. Yeah. Now, help us out the cream and sugar. Thank you. My, that's good. <laughs> Hey, you're a perfect host, Dr. Watson. No, no. You're pulling my leg. Being a good host is G. Washington's coffee, Mr. Bell. No trouble at all. It only takes a minute. And it's as easy to make as a slice of toast. Or as easy to use as granulated sugar. How's that for freshness and convenience? Well, I'd say, like Sherlock Holmes, it couldn't be beat. Oh, no, another hint, Mr. Bell. <laughs> well, yes, we'd better get on with our story, I suppose. What adventure are we to start off with tonight, uh, Dr. Watson? Mm, how'd it be if I tell you how Sherlock Holmes solved the case of the Hebraic breastplate? Hebraic breastplate? Yes, it was quite a famous museum piece. Some authorities went so far as to say it had been worn originally by King Solomon himself. At any rate, it was supposed to have a curse attached to it. To my own personal knowledge, it caused the death of two men and nearly robbed an eminent scholar of his good name. That sounds sufficiently ominous for anyone, Dr. Watson. It was, Mr. Bell, it was. Why, even now, when I recall that night in the dark, deserted halls, of the Belmore Street Museum with the moonlight sliding slowly from one of those incredible mummy cases to the other. But <laughs> there I go, anticipating myself as usual. Well, anticipation, you know, you're starting chills running up and down my spine. <laughs> Have I indeed? Inconsiderate of me, wasn't it? Well, plenty of time for that later on. In any event, the whole thing started one foggy afternoon in March of the year 1894. You know the sort of day we have in London at that season? A yellowish fog blew in cold, dank waves down Baker Street. There was no day for venturing abroad, and yet that was just what I was planning to do. As I entered the sitting room of our lodgings in search of my top hat, I found the place in even wilder disorder than usual. In the midst of this chaos sat Holmes, his long tapering fingers and his hawk-like nose intent on a singularly unsavory mess of chemical abracadabra. The taut, seized and boiled, the weird blue flame of a Bunsen burner was reflected in his eyes. <laughs> Quiet, Watson. Absolute quiet. Don't move. Don't breathe. A man's life depends on this step. 
Now, you see this leader retort? Yes. And then says the appearance of clear water. It is clear water, Watson, with the addition of an infinitesimal amount of an unknown substance extracted from a small stain on a man's coat sleeve. Is that substance blood, human blood? That's the important question. Now, we add a few white crystals and wait for the reaction. Ooh, I see. Oh, the water's changing color. It's turned a dull mahogany. Yes, and there's a distinct brownish dust precipitated at the bottom of the retort. Magnificent. Positively magnificent, Watson. The old glycum and microscopic test for the blood corpuscles was clumsy and uncertain. But this test, the Sherlock Holmes test, is infallible. The prisoner is guilty, Watson. Guilty as the devil. That brownish precipitate will hang him. Holmes, you know, your scientific cold bloodedness gives me the creep. Uh, nonsense, Watson, nonsense. You wouldn't hesitate to shoot down a hawk that had been preying on your livestock, would you? Why hesitate to destroy the criminal who's been fattening on the blood of human beings? Must you be so graphic in your descriptions, Holmes? Where's my hat? What hat? My top hat, of course. I left it in here when I came in for losing my patience this morning. How anyone can expect to find anything in all this litter? And, uh, Watson, if you can't keep track of your own wearing apparel, I'm sure that I can't... Oh, uh, uh, that wouldn't be it by any chance. Where? Uh, there, on the floor by the desk. Oh, I say, Holmes, you've used it as a waste paper basket oh, sorry, again. Sorry, Watson, sorry, but if you will leave it about, oh, what would you want with a hat this late in the afternoon? Surely you're not thinking of venturing out into this foul weather? I am, I most certainly am. Furthermore, it may interest you to know that since you've become involved in this soup-off case, the house has smelled like a cross between a crate of distinctly senile eggs and a bear pit. The weather may be foul, but it's not as foul as the atmosphere of this room. I mm, no idea. I had no idea you were so delicate. Besides, I've just received an invitation from my friend Ward Mortimer to go round to the Belmore Street Museum and view the collection. Mm, indeed. Mortimer's about to take over the curatorship, I believe. And what's become of the old curator, Professor Andrews? He can't be much over 55, and the reputation of his management and lecture courses was excellent. And he turned in his resignation at the last meeting of the Board of Trustees, I believe. Yes, yes, but for what reason? Oh, something about failing eyesight. Mm -hmm. They should have a younger man in charge of such a valuable collection. Promised to accompany Mr. Mortimer on his first tour of inspection this afternoon. They say the professor's a wonder. That's why I'm particularly anxious to go. Yeah, so now Ward Mortimer is trying to fill the professor's shoes, huh? I thought he was still excavating near Thebes in the Valley of the Kings. Oh, no. After Mortimer exhumed what's believed to be the mummy of Cleopatra in the inner room of the Temple of Horns at Pylae, he decided to come home. Oh, uh, so he found it, did he? Yes, I thought he might. Watson, I think I'll join you in your visit to the Belmore Street Museum. But the here, Holmes, you weren't invited. No matter, Watson, no matter. Ward Mortimer will be delighted to see me. It was I who suggested to him that he should dig at Filey for Cleopatra's remains. Besides, uh, now that you mention it, the, uh, the air in this room is a bit tainted. Yes, it might be as well to go elsewhere until the uh, aroma clears away. An unexpected pleasure. I'm delighted to see you again, Mr. Mortimer. So you found the lady where I told you to look for her, huh? Mm -hmm. Cleopatra? Yes. Indeed I did. But how in the world you knew she was there is beyond me. No, I keep telling him he's lucky he wasn't born a few centuries back. He's been burned for witchcraft. Uh, nonsense, Watson, nonsense. The whole matter was extremely simple. Merely the correct interpretation of an old papyrus that has never been correctly translated before. Well, that's beside the point. I believe we're here to see the treasures of the museum. Of course. I'm a very neglectful host, I'm afraid. I don't believe you met Professor Andrews. Mr. Holmes, Dr. Watson. Uh, how do you do, gentlemen? Uh, this is a great privilege, Professor Andrews. Uh -huh. uh, you're very kind, gentlemen. And this is my valued assistant, Captain Wilson, whom Mr. Mortimer has been trying to pray to stay on. But Wilson has been invited to join an expedition that is intent on digging up dusty relics in Asia Minor. We feel we have at last located the site of the ancient city of Troy. Just think what it would mean, gentlemen, to see the very hall where Helen lives. 
to walk the streets where Achilles kept her. <laughs> there you are. Uh, it's what I call the digging fever. All archaeologists suffer from the curly attack of it. <laughs> but uh, come, uh, let us begin our tour of inspection. Uh, for me, this is at once a proud and a sad occasion. But in any event, my love of the collection is, I hope, greater than any personal regret. This museum needs the supervision and protection of a man in full possession of all his faculties. Oh, no. And there's uh, uh, my failing sight. Uh, however, enough of that. There are 15 rooms in this museum, gentlemen, all given over to the treasures of the Orient. But this hall in which we are now standing, which contains the Jewish and Egyptian collections, is undoubtedly the pick of the lot. Now, let us take the Jewish side first. Yes, yes, indeed. And here oh, is what man. I believe to be the only authentic duplicate of the famous seven brass candlestick of the temple, which was brought to Rome, as you know, by Titus, and which is lying at this instant somewhere in the mud in the bed of the river Tiber. And uh, here in this case is perhaps the most valuable article in the entire museum. Now, uh, first I put the key to this locker. Uh, uh, oh, yes, uh, here we are. Uh, I say it is a beauty, whatever it is. Twelve enormous stones, all different colors, like paint in a paint box, and set in gold. And each stone has some funny looking scratches on its surface. Those are ancient Hebrew hieroglyphics, Dr. Watson. This is the Urim and Thummim. The Urim and what in? Urim and Thummim was the name given to the jewel plate which lay on the breast of the high priest of the Jews. Which fact you would remember, Watson, if you'd paid better attention in your Sunday school days. Now, really, Holmes, the home is correct, gentlemen. The jewel's breast plate of the high priest was held in a special reverence by the ancient Hebrews, somewhat as the Sibylline books were regarded in the capital of Rome. This particular Urim and Thummim is the most magnificent in existence. In fact, uh, I believe I'm correct in saying that it belonged originally to Solomon himself. At any rate, those hieroglyphics are supposed to be the curse of Solomon. Curse of Solomon? Yes, uh, this best age is supposed to bring death to anyone who lays his reverend hands upon it. Uh, that is why no one but Captain Wilson and myself have been allowed to handle it. I uh, see. In other words, something has occurred which leads you to believe the curse is still in effect. Well, I'm not what you would call a superstitious man myself. And yet, within a week of the time when that cat first came to this museum, the night watchman was found dead one morning with the best page in his hand. You mean he'd attempted to steal it? Uh, probably. Jewels as magnificent as these are bound to be a great temptation. However, I must say that since the first calamity became known, it has been left entirely unmolested. Yes, the stones are remarkably large. You may I see them more closely, please. Uh, are you, uh, oh, but please, uh, you must pardon me, Mr. Holmes, if I've seen two courses, but I would rather you wouldn't touch them. You see, I would like to bring my curatorship to a close without any further uh, accident. Oh, yes, yes, it's quite understandable, I'm sure. I only wish to determine their classification. So I can tell you that. Counting from the top left-hand corner, the stones are... Carnelian, Cerido, Emerald, Ruby, Lapis Lazuli, Onyx, Sapphire, Agate, Amethyst, Topaz, Stereo, and Jasper. Captain Wilson, who is a practical authority upon precious stones, will tell you that these are remarkably pure. Oh, well. And the gold work is also worthy of attention. If you look very closely, the tiny pattern. Uh, pardon me, Mr. Jetson, but uh, you'll find a finer example of the Jewish gold work in the candlestick in the next case. Uh, quite so, Wilson, quite so. And uh, we can all handle that quite freely. Uh, come, gentlemen. Uh, uh, Wilson, uh, you will return this best day to its case, if you please. Certainly, Mr. Jetson. And uh, make sure the case is locked. Oh, absolutely. Uh, uh, here's the key. Thank and uh, now, gentlemen, um, let's inspect this gold candlestick. Uh, uh, one moment, Professor. This uh, mummy case, this is a uh, recent acquisition, I think. Yes, uh, certainly, but uh, how did you know? Well, there is a tiny particle of excelsior packing still on the floor. Ah, so there is, yeah, yeah. I was afraid the teeny woman is getting carried again. Now, about this mummy case, surely it is of Egyptian origin, and yet you placed it here among the Judean relics. Ah, very nice point, Mr. Holmes. The mummy case is undoubtedly of Egyptian manufacture, and yet it was unearthed in the remains of Solomon's temple, probably the last resting place of some high priest to admire the Egyptian culture. These various oriental civilizations often overlap. Yes, them. yes, but does the case still contain the money? Oh, yes, indeed. It is in coincidence, isn't it? The high priest returns to watch over the urine and semen which he wore some thousands of years ago. Yes, he is a curious person. No one can be safe. No, 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 no
What the hell? Listen. What's wrong? What the hell? He's trying to get the doctor. Quick, quick. Tell him. Get the doctor. Get the doctor. Too late, Professor Andrews. I'm afraid the poor chap's dead. <laughs> Not entirely, Professor. Hmm. Poor chap has something held tightly in his right hand. Now let's find out what it is. It's extraordinary, as I could have said in already. Yes, I can hardly scratch the finger up breaking the fingers. Yes, 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 just as I thought. It's the Jewish breastplate. For the love of heaven, give it to me because something happens to you. Oh, calm yourself, Professor. The curse has spent itself at least for the time being. Oh, that breastplate. I wish I'd never laid eyes on the accursed thing. Poor Wilson. What a horrible end to my term of office. Professor Andrews, Wilson's death, if I am not greatly mistaken, is not an end to anything. It's just the beginning. Look here, Holmes. Do you have to eat all the kippers? I'm merely doing it to prevent you from blowing up, Watson. Your waste plans are disgrace. Here, pour me out another cup of coffee. There's a good chap. Why, is that what you are? Oh, Utterly oh, and oh. irrevocably spoiled. Yeah, it was tragic, the sudden death of that poor young chap yesterday afternoon. You mean Captain Wilson? Well, who do you think I meant? Humpty Dumpty? <laughs> Who looked thought to look at him? The fellow had a bad heart. Well, it wasn't his heart that caused his death, Watson. It was Solomon's cat. Oh, now you're being fantastic. No, well, there's nothing fantastic about that curse, my dear Watson. It's very real and extremely efficacious. What are you babbling about, Holmes? The ancient oriental poison in the little needle hidden in the back of that Jewish breastplate. No, the ancient orientals knew a great deal more about poisons than we do, thank heaven. You mean Captain Wilson was poisoned? Oh, what do you think? You saw the Titanic convulsions, the extreme post-mortem rigor? I do. You may be right with that. Maybe. I am right. Wilson was killed by the jolly little mechanism hidden at the back of the breastplate. Yes, but if that needle thing in the bob still works, oughtn't you to warn the authorities or something? Oh, no, no, necessarily. No use harrowing the poor old professor with the idea that the death of his guard and his assistant might have been prevented. Yes, but what if someone else gets himself punctured? Well, that's not very likely, Watson. You see, I took the precaution of removing the little pin before I handed the thing back to Professor Andrews. Well, then, if the days is removed, what made you say that Wilson's death was just the beginning of the trouble? <laughs> Oh, come in, come in. Ah, uh, Mrs. Hudson, and in the role of Hermes, if I'm not mistaken. Who's she? Uh, he, Mrs. Hudson. He, Hermes, was the messenger of the Greek god. You mean the one with the feathers on his hat and on his feet? Yes. I'll thank you not to compare me with the likes of him, Mr. Holmes. I've got more clothes on, I hope. Oh, yes, 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 quite, quite. I was merely alluding to the letter you have in your hand. addressed to me, if I am not mistaken. It is that. And what's more, it is urgent. Come by and this is. The messenger's waiting in a cab outside. Oh, don't see. Well, 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 let's see what it's all about. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, Mr. Holmes. We have been robbed. Come at once. Sign Ward Mortimer. Oh, well, Watson, get your hat. You have the answer to your question. But I hardly hoped it would come so soon, though. <laughs> The breastplate has been tampered with. Someone must have done it during the night. The settings of the first six stones are rough and jagged, as if, as if someone had scraped around them. It looks to me as if someone had been trying to take out the stones, eh, Holmes? My theory is that he not only tried, but succeeded, Dr. Watson. And these six stones are imitations. Well, you may put aside your fears in that score, Mr. Mortimer. I'll stake my reputation that all six of these stones is genuine. Thank heaven for that. And what in the world does the thief want? Well, perhaps if we consult Professor Andrews in the matter, we might... I tried to get in touch with him, but it seems that he left for Scotland last oh, night. Pity. Now, did the watchman hear anything in the night? I've questioned him thoroughly, I promise you. 
He made his rounds four times as usual, but at no time did he see or hear anything amiss. And yet this job must have taken the better part of eight hours to complete. Now, could this thief have entered through the window? Possible. Yeah, or heavily barred. Furthermore, I myself attended to the locking and bolting of the main door last night. All the locks and bolts were intact this morning. Oh, and uh, that uh, skylight up there, now, where does that lead? That goes on to the lumber room, Mr. Hosey. But it's remained unopened for years, as you can see by the dust on it. Well, uh, what other openings are there to the museum? There's a door to my private room. Mm -hmm. But even that is locked at night. And in order to reach it, anyone from the street would have to open my outer door as well. And neither you nor the watchman heard anything. Not a thing. Significant. Very significant. Yes, Watson, I think a night spent in the lumber room upstairs is indicated. The work is not finished. Six of the stones remain untouched. And I'm very anxious to see the intruder who can slide through a locked door and who is completely invisible to your night watchman, Mr. Mortimer. like a rusty hinge. I think it's as dark as the inside of my pocket up here. Oh! Oh! Yes. oh I've stumbled over something. Yes, that, if I'm not mistaken, is the skylight we've discovered. Yes, sir. Yes, I can feel the glass. It's so covered with dust, you can't see a thing. But let me wipe it off. Stop, stop. Leave it alone. We don't want to be visible to anyone from below. Yes, but how in the time? I'll get yeah. off a peephole for you and one for myself. Now, if you lie down on the floor and put your eye to that. But in my best trousers, the place is filthy. Yeah. Well, here, here's some sacking I brought along. Oh, right. But I must say, I'm not... Come out that dust. What? You sound like a 21 gun salute. Do you want to fight in the feet? But I didn't do it on purpose. <coughs> the moonlight shining in through the window down there is extremely bright for me. How oh, weird everything looks in that light. That mummy case seems almost in my face. Holmes, what's that curious evil glow directly below us? Like many colored eyes. Those are the gems in the Jewish breastplate. There's only six of them seem to be on fire. Yes, for a very good reason that only six of them are real. It's you, sir. No, mind what I said. Keep your eye on that breastplate. It's 11 o'clock, Holmes. Yes, he won't be able to wait much longer. Holmes! The head is on that money case. Look, it's moving. Good Lord, so it is. The lid is sliding back. The money case is opening up. Holmes! There's a hand in the opening. The white, thin hand of a mummy. What if it's the high priest? Oh, Holmes, let's get out of here. I don't know what you Don't breathe. It's not a mummy. It's a man. A small, thin man. He's stealing out the mummy case. Like a fox out of his burrow. Turns his head quickly from left to right. I can't see the face. Holmes, Holmes. He's slinking to the case. The case that contains the breastplate. He raises the lid. This is the moonlight. Good Lord, it's Professor Andrews. He says you can found it. He's trying to get away. Wait the glass, Watson. We must jump through and catch it. Here, yeah, hold him off, Watson. Oh, no, no. He's oh. down. I've got you. Hold him up. Hold him up. Like the gas. Are you coming? Have you got him? Yes, like the gas. Don't let him go, Watson. No fear. Good Lord, it's Professor Andrews. Of course, I knew it from the first. I'm still under the thief. Oh, no, you're wrong, Mortimer. Professor Andrews is not the thief. The thief is dead. Uh, thank you, Mr. Holmes. I, really, my conduct is entirely reprehensible. I realize that I am not a thief. In fact, I didn't realize the jewels had been stolen until I found them in Captain Wilson's effects after his death. Yes, I knew they were false when I saw them yesterday afternoon, Professor. I didn't want to spoil your last day in office. Oh, that was very kind of you, Mr. Holmes. When Wilson stole them, I don't know. You see, my eyesight has been failing for some time. And although I used to be a very good judge of precious stones... Yes, but Holmes, you told me yourself this morning that those jewels were real. Only the first six months. My dear Mortimer, only the first six. 
Professor Andrews replaced those last night. Unfortunately, his handiwork was not as neat as Wilson's had been. You probably to his failing eyesight, and you were able to detect it. Yes, but Professor Andrews, when you found the jewels, why didn't you inform the police? What good would that have done? It, it was discredited by the whole regime. And that in the name of Captain Wilson. No, surely he's paid the punishment of his crime. Furthermore, I owed it to him. After all, I knew of that poison needle. I thought the mechanism, but controlled it wouldn't work. It is true, but I should have had it removed. Oh, don't blame yourself too severely, Professor. The cause of Wilson's death goes further back than any of us remember. Back to the curse of Solomon. After all, he had laid profane hands upon the breastplate of the high priest, and the wrath of the god of Judea is not to be taken lightly. A remarkable story, Dr. Watson. But how did Sherlock Holmes deduce that it was Professor Andrews who had tampered with the breastplate? Holmes would say, elementary, Mr. Bell, elementary. Professor Andrews is the only person who knew the night watchman's routine and could therefore keep out of his way. Besides, Holmes figured that Professor Andrews had probably retained his key to the curator's door and could therefore slip in and out of the museum at will. Simple, isn't it? And you know how it's done. As simple as making a cup of G. Washington coffee. There you go, pulling my leg again, Mr. Bell. If the solution of that crime were as easy as making this coffee, why, a four-year-old child could have solved it. And here, I'm sure you'd like another cup. Elementary, Dr. Watson, elementary. You can't go wrong on that deduction. Of course I want another cup, but... Can't I have one of the new one-cup services and make my own? Oh, it's pleasure, Mr. Bell. I see they fascinate you as they do everyone who sees them. Tear open the soft metal top. Yes. So, yes. Empty the fresh crystals into your cup. Yes. Add the hot water. And there's a cup of fragrant coffee as fresh as fresh can be. Well, there's no end to G. Washington magic, Dr. Watson. Next week at this same hour, Dr. Watson will be with us again with another of his famous stories of the adventures of Sherlock Holmes. Closing George Washington Coffee uh, commercial. One thing that they play on here, uh, and th- this is particularly true since this is uh, 1934, uh, they play on this idea uh, that Doctor Watson is still alive, um, and that he, uh, and that he is talking about his adventures uh, with Sherlock Holmes, and that 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 would be thoroughly possible given that most of Holmes' adventures happened towards the end of the 19th century. We're in 1933. So it's not inconceivable that uh, Dr. Watson could be kicking around and coming on to hawk some George Washington coffee, I guess. Um, Really nice uh, sponsorship and placement there. Um, As for the adventure itself, I have to say it, it it dragged on a little bit. Um, I, I think the story was it was just a little off, and, and so it wasn't perhaps the best paced story. Uh, but we get to know a new Holmes, new Watson, get kind of a mystery here, uh, and we'll see if be- if there's better things to come. This is actually the last of the 1934 uh, episodes, uh, so we'll be back with actually a 1935 episode of Sherlock Holmes uh, next week. 
From Boise, Idaho, this is your host, Adam Graham, bringing you another uh, exciting edition of yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Um, as we get started, I've got, got a programming announcement, and that is that we'll have a show tomorrow. Um, it's an exceptional thing. I don't expect we will um, will ever have another Saturday show for reasons we'll talk about in the second half. Um, but uh, Andrew Rines, who does our audio editing, has started his own old-time radio podcast, this time focusing on Westerns, and he's got quite a lineup. He's got The Lone Ranger, The Cisco Kid, Have Gone, Will Travel, um, The Six Shooter, and Challenge of the Yukons. Uh, and he's going to be posting five episodes a week. So just head on over, uh, if, if you're interested, to eagleforlife69.com slash OTR. That's Eagle, E-A-G-L-E, four, number four, life, 69.com slash OTR, as an old-time radio. Um, now, we're going to give you a sneak preview of the, the show, uh, and tomorrow we're going to present an episode of Have Gun, Will Travel. Uh, so, uh, definitely listen. It was actually listed at, on the thrillingdetectives.com as a detective series, so I felt comfortable as that being the appropriate show to uh, give... Uh, to give you a sneak peek of what uh, Andrew is working on. So thanks so much. Uh, go and uh, check that out. Um, actually, through um, listening to Have Gun Will Travel, and I, I absolutely love that, the second episode of, the, of uh, Have Gun Will Travel, um, I, uh, I found out a little bit about the show and got some insight to what it might have happened to uh, Charles Russell. In the world of radio, uh, it actually uh, was the norm where whole productions would be dumped. The actors um, would just simply be told, adios, uh, without any real advance warning. Uh, one actor who played the, uh, the he said he thought it was the ninth Ellery Queen, um, said that he basically went in, did a show one day, and was told never to come back again. Um, that he was done and he was out of there. So perhaps that's what happened with uh, Mr. Russell. Uh, kind of some speculation, but uh, kind of gives us a little bit more information to even uh, base the speculation on. Um, now, one thing I, I do want to clear up here uh, is I made a big error uh, with Sherlock Holmes. I, uh, I stated uh, that last week's episode of uh, Sherlock Holmes, The Noble Bachelor, was not an original Holmes story. Uh, that was incorrect. It was in The Adventures of uh, Sherlock Holmes. Uh, in fact, um, I know this because, uh, because uh, s someone left a comment on Podcast Alley. says, love the new show. I'm definitely already a Johnny Dollar fan. I've been a Sherlock Holmes fan for many years, and I may be the first of many to tell you that The Noble Bachelor is an original story by Arthur Conan Doyle. It is the tenth in the short stories, The Adventures of Sherlock Holmes. This fact will probably come back to bite you for a while when more home fans, Holmes fans download your podcast. Well, I did leave a little note in the show notes indicating there was a mistake in correcting it here, because um, that's obviously a, uh, a little bit of, a, uh, of an error on my part. Uh, I, I actually went ahead, I got nervous about yesterday's show, the Hebraic Breastplate, and I was like, I'm almost certain that's not a Sherlock Holmes story. Well, I found out it was not a Sherlock Holmes story. However, uh, it was an Arthur Conan, uh, an Arthur Conan Doyle, uh, based on an Arthur Conan Doyle story. Uh, it was not any of the Sherlock Holmes books. What happened, uh, and this has happened with some of the detective short stories. Uh, for example, Raymond Chandler did not write any stories that were originally about Phil Philip Marlowe until the mid-50s. However, there are several short stories uh, by Raymond Chandler that were, um, he used the word, cannibalized uh, in order to readapt them to fit with uh, Philip Marlowe. And so that's what we saw happen with the Hebraic uh, breastplate. It was 
It was based on a non-Sherlock Holmes story by Arthur Conan Doyle uh, called the uh, uh, called the Jewish uh, the Jew's Breastplate. Um, and uh, I actually uh, it what and that's p- part of the reason it didn't ring true because I think you could more easily cannibalize some of Raymond Chandler's stuff, make it something that mostly suited Philip Marlowe than you could Arthur Conan Doyle's other stories, which, other than perhaps The Lost World, weren't uh, near as uh, notable. Uh, in fact, I'm, I'm reading, I've, I just finished reading a, uh, a novel, a modern uh, Sherlock Holmes uh, uh, adventure, where part of the uh, plot is that Arthur Conan Doyle was only a ghostwriter, and they used as evidence for that, um, that other works were not as successful or as well written as Sherlock Holmes. So I don't think Doyle fans necessarily would appreciate it, but that was the view expressed in Nightwatch. So, all right. Um, also, some people had problems downloading um, uh, downloading uh, Pat Novak for Hire, uh, episode two last week. Um, if you had any problem, uh, they ended up downloading uh, the first week's ep- uh, first week's episode. We got that fixed, so you can go to our uh, to our our page in the iTunes Store or go to GreatDetectives.net and uh, download the Pat Novak episode there. If you had any problems on Tuesday, um, one thing I thought of, particularly listening to Pat Novak for hire, I thought, you know, this would make a, some of these sayings and stuff would make great T-shirts. So I went over to Cafe Press and I set up an account and I discovered the one flaw in my plan. I can't make t-shirts. Don't have the uh, uh, know-how. But if you are an artist, um, you can actually get, I found out, an affiliate account with Cafe Press. So here's the deal. If you are an artist and you are inspired to make a show about one of our detective uh, detective series. Play, I recommend stay with those that were originally written for the radio, or like Sherlock Holmes, have lapsed into the public domain. And I think actually every show we're doing right now will qualify. Um, go ahead if you make a uh, if you make a T-shirt, we will go ahead and uh, we we'll put it on a special section of GreatDetectives.net uh, so people can uh, purchase that, and then uh, you'll get something from. Um, uh, you'll get something from uh, Cafe Press, and then we'll we'll get the affiliate. So, all right, uh, we got one relevant podcast alley comment before we get into the show, and we'll have a couple more after we get back from the break. Uh, but this one, or uh, I tried to find the great detectives to vote, uh, but a search did not provide it. Um, and I, I appreciate that. I actually could not find this without doing to Google and searching for great detectives. However, um, you can go ahead and just put podcastalley.greatdetectives.net, and that will take you to our Podcast Alley site. So encourage people to do that, um, and you can vote for us there. Um, But uh, he goes on to write, I love the Dick Powell episode of Johnny Dollar. I was introduced to Dick Powell through Turner Classic Movies, and not being familiar with him, have come to enjoy and appreciate his performances. He brings a wry humor to many of his roles. I appreciate your introductions to this new show, and have uploaded all available podcasts. Well, thanks so much. And, uh, yeah, one thing, and it's perhaps not been underscored, is how big of a loss I think the producers viewed this as being not to get Dick Powell. Dick Powell actually has three separate places on the Hollywood Walk of Fame. One for movies, one for radio, and one for uh, one for television. So this was a big star, and I, I compared it uh, to losing George Clooney and getting George Went. Um, now, certainly not to dish on uh, Charles Russell, who I think, like I said a, a couple times, I think does does a pretty good job of uh, of doing Johnny Dollar. And really, when people analyze the show, he really suffers by comparison to other Johnny Dollars, not to other detective shows. Um, but that said, um, we're going to get into the show. I do want to encourage you uh, to go uh, and fill out our survey, survey. Uh, dot greatdetectives.net. We want to go ahead and get that filled out in plenty of time um, for, uh, 
for our, our friends at Blueberry um, so that we know who's listening in our audience. So go to survey.greatdetectives.net. Um, and we're going to get into today's episode. This episode is the first episode of Johnny Dollar from outside of the United States. This is also uh, the first time we mark a missing episode. Mind in the Shadows was the second episode of Johnny Dollar, uh, but it is not in circulation. I did find a site that said they did have Mind in the Shadows, um, but it was only the first 17 minutes of the Perikoff policy, which we heard last week. Kind of, well, that's not nice. Anyway, let's go ahead and get into today's episode, A Slow Boat from China. The Columbia Broadcasting System presents Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. The next half hour has its baggage packed to take a trip with America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator, Johnny Dollar. At insurance investigation, he is just an expert. At making out his expense account, he is an absolute genius. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to Home Office, Oriental West, Cargo Bonding Company, San Francisco. The following is an accounting of my expenditures during my investigation of delayed cargo aboard the SS Shanghai Wayfair, or the case of the slow boat from China. <laughs> Expense account, item one, $181.52. Plane fare from Hartford, Hartford to San Francisco in answer to your urgent call. Expense account, item two, $3. Lunch on Fisherman's Wharf in answer to my stomach's urgent call. Item three, $1.20. Cab fare to your office. Dollar, my name is Fundy. I haven't had the pleasure of meeting you before. I mean, I say it's a pleasure meeting you. It's a rough trip. I'm glad it's over. Over? Oh, it's just begun. Here, Dollar. This is your plane ticket to Singapore. Singapore? Mm hmm You know, Fundy, I had a choice. Really? To come to San Francisco to see you or to take a case in Boston. A nice old lady on Beacon Hill clubbed her husband with an early American bed warmer. But no, rather than New England broiled lobster, I'd rather have San Francisco cracked crab. Now, all of a sudden, Singapore. May I ask why? Uh, yes. We've bonded against the delay a $120,000 cargo of raw tin aboard the Shanghai Wayfarer. The ship was due to sail from Singapore three weeks ago. Still out there, tied up in the Tanjong Pagar dock. What's the delay? Mutinous, mechanical, or just plain mysterious? Uh, I'm afraid it's little of each. We flew an expediter out there ten days ago to see what he could do. All the satisfaction we've had from this man Harrison is a report that since his arrival, the wayfarer's main shaft has burned out, her freshwater pumps have fouled up, and her steering machinery has gone on the fritz. You don't need an insurance investigator. You need a good plumber. <laughs> well, maybe you're right. But anyhow, you'll find our man Harrison, William Harrison, at the Crown Colony Hotel. He'll fill in the details. Dollar, you have only a matter of hours after you hit Singapore to get the Shanghai Wayfarer started on its way. I, uh, I must impress upon you the fact that any delay after that will cost this company $2,500 a day. Well, all I can promise is the old college try. Times like this, I wish I'd gone to college. Well, anyway, I'm in the right town to make my last night in the States a good one. A few drinks with the right gal at the top of the mark. A few rare steaks at Alfred's, a few dances to Freddie Martin's music at the St. Francis, a few moments alone in the arms... A dollar. Huh? That sounds mighty good. But your plane leaves in two hours. Two hours? Well, I guess I'll have to do without the drinks, the dinner, and the dancing. Expense account item four, $120. Lost in the course of teaching fellow passenger how to play poker. My mother warned me not to never to play cards with strangers on trains or steamships. I wish she'd included airplanes. You'd implied, Fundy, that the situation smelled. Well, you should have caught a whip of the city, especially the native sections, through which I had to pass on my way to the Crown Colony Hotel. I found it on Anson Road. I found myself a room. I also found William Harrison's room. Harrison? Hey, Harrison. Hmm? 
But I didn't find Harrison. All I found was a calling card from my old friend Trouble. Wherever Harrison was, he didn't want to be. And he left a trail of broken furniture and blood to prove it. I searched the dresser. Shirt size, 14. Socks, 9. That meant Harrison was a small man. I went to the bathroom, shaving brush and toothbrush still wet, indicating that he'd been there not too many hours before I arrived. Then I tried the wastebasket. In addition to one large glob of used chewing gum, an empty cigarette package, and some old Kleenex, I found a swizzle stick with a name on it. The Collier Key Bar. Well, all that meant was that Harrison had a head cold and been trying to cure it with Singapore slings. But at least I knew where he'd been drinking. <laughs> The Collier Key Bar looked out on the harbor. It was dark enough inside to give a man a good excuse for drinking nightcaps at noon. Your pleasure, sir? Say, uh, how are you on mixed drinks? Mixed drinks? Governor, if I don't know how to make them, I look them up in the book. If they ain't in the book, I fake them. Now, what will they? <laughs> Straight bourbon. Right, your sir. Oh, hey, uh, bartender. Yes, sir. Are you by any chance acquainted with an American named uh, Harrison? Uh, Harrison, sir? Yeah. He arrived in Singapore about ten days ago. Small man with a cold in his head. Oh, Harrison. Sure, I know him mm-hmm. right enough. He's been coming in every night with a chief engineer from one of the ships in port. Oh, yeah? What ship is that? Oh, the Shanghai Wayfarer, I think. Oh, the Shanghai Wayfarer. What's this engineer's name? He and our old arm, I, I ain't getting him into any trouble, am I? He's a nice chap, he is. A handsome tipper. This handsome? My governor, 20 American dollars, why? Compared to you, sir, Mr. Frank Moore is downright tight fisted. Well, now, how about that? Uh, I done it. I let Mr. Frank Moore's name slip right now. My missus is right. For a little man, I've got a ruddy large mouth. <laughs> Expense account, item five. Rickshaw fare to the Tanjung Pagar docks, ten cents. Tip to Pony Boy, one dollar. The ships moored fore and aft of the Shanghai Wayfarer were busy stuffing the pungent treasures of the East into their deep steel pockets. And the only sign of life aboard the Shanghai Wayfarer was the right hand of the burly gangway watch. It was holding a knife with a six-inch blade and slicing thin slivers off a plug that looked more like tar than tobacco. As a gangway watch, he might have been fine. But as a reception committee, he was no Elsa Maxwell. That's far enough, mate. There's nobody aboard and there's nobody coming aboard. It's all right with me. All I want is a little information. Where can I find your chief engineer, Frank Moore? You come to the wrong place. By the icebox over at the Singapore police. They fished him out of the harbor this morning, stabbed to death. Oh? Uh, Have any idea who did it? Holding some dame he's been playing around with. No, I don't know her name. Have they got anything else? Listen, mate, my job is to guard the ship, not answer questions. Okay, okay, have it your way. Watch out for pirates. <laughs> the British chief inspector, Singapore police, gave me everything except an invitation to tea. But unfortunately, he never even heard of Harrison. He took me into the morgue, and a look at Frank Moore's body told me nothing I didn't already know. He'd been stabbed, all right. And whoever had killed him had sunk him with a hole in one. As for his personal effects, his Maritime Union card confirmed the fact that he was indeed the chief engineer of the Shanghai Wayfarer. A stack of crisp American $20 bills in his wallet made me wonder whether he hadn't been picking up a little extra pin money for delaying the departure of his ship. And finally, a photograph that made me admire the late Mr. Moore's taste in women. Whoever it was that said, never the twain shall meet, should have met her. She was half cast and all woman. Her picture was inscribed to Frank Moore. Yours forever, Chandra. From the inspector, I learned two more things. One, the fact that the police had already questioned and released her. And two, her business address, the Wardlow Bar on Melee Street. Hello, Mr. Yank. You like a midnight sing song, girl? No. The only girl I want to hear sing songs is Dinah Shaw. Go on, beat it, will you? Oh, hey, wait a minute. Yes, do I? Uh, where's Chandra? Oh, she go across to Penang tonight. You buy me drink, mister? We sit right over. Munja, the gunner. Get it. Oh, the Munja, hello. I put you away home to stay right one night. Huh? In your own coffee. Complete with stab wounds, no doubt. Why you say that? Why you ask for Chandra? 
I'm a stranger in town. I can't find the local chapter of the Lonely Hearts Club. So, shall we find a quiet table? I don't know you. No, but you knew Frank Moore. That gives us something in common. Over there is one. Okay. <laughs> Doesn't sound like a very quiet table to me. In Singapore, you will learn whispers stand out in the quiet. They disappear in the noise. I'll bow to the wisdom of the native guide. But uh, who said I had any secrets? You talk about Frank Moore, so I know. If you do not have secrets to give, there must be secrets you like to learn. But I tell the police everything I know, which is nothing. Oh, no, you are disappointed in me? No, no, not at all. You make good scenery. And I'll bet there's quite a story that goes with you. Oh, you find me interesting. I'm a man. Why do you come to me? Well, there were two places I could go for what I'm after. And you're much prettier than the SS Shanghai Wayfarer. I'm looking for a lead on a man named Harrison. Your murdered friend Frank Moore knew him, so figures you know him. You are wrong. I do not know him. I do not even know you. Oh, well, that's soon fixed. My name is Johnny Dollar. Your name is nice. Especially the uh, salad part, huh? You are very droll, but I see when you make this joke, there is no smile on your face. You are worried about your friend, Mr. Harrison? Yeah, that's right. Maybe he was lonely tonight. Maybe he does not want you to find him. Ah, you certainly make me feel much better. How about a drink? I never drink before midnight. All right, then I'll wait. We'll have one then. All right, Johnny. But we don't have it here. We go to my house. There it is cool on the river. And there it is quiet. So we do not have to whisper. Midnight must have been invented for Singapore, and her house must have been invented for midnight. Only one thing looked out of place. Up on the wall was a souvenir of Chandra's war effort, a real American baseball bat, a Louisville slugger. And on it was written, Remember the U.S. Marines. Everything else in the place was soft. The lights, cushions, and Chandra. It is nicer to drink here, no? Yeah, may I say it's uh, a mite intoxicating without a drink. I wish the boys back in my high school senior class could see me now. What do you mean? In the graduation annual, they predicted I'd be a bookkeeper. Oh, I do not understand you. And neither did the boys in my senior class. Johnny, please say things I can understand. I want to know you better. Maybe if I stop talking altogether, you'll get to know me better. Johnny... stopped talking, but I didn't stop thinking. When I'd mentioned Harrison to Chandra earlier, she said maybe he was lonely tonight. If she didn't know him or anything about him, I wondered how she knew that he was missing tonight and not for a couple of days, or maybe even longer. Besides, the boyfriends of women like her don't keep secrets. I still assume that if Frank Moore had known Harrison, Chandra had known Harrison. I also assumed that she'd spited me into her parlor for purposes other than social. And that notion was seconded soon after I had it, when somebody kicked the door open. Hey, is this your Johnny Dollar? The two boys in the door were not from Western Union. And ugly as they were, Chandra left my side to join them, which made me think that maybe my senior class had been right. Looking at that trio six eyes and two guns glaring at me, I wished I was a bookkeeper. <laughs> In just a moment, we'll return to the second act of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. But first, here it is almost the end of February. All over the country, people are thinking about their new cars. All but one man. And he remains quite content with his old automobile and wearing apparel. An ancient Maxwell and a well-worn toupee. 
For these reasons, and for several others, named Mary, Dennis, Don, Phil, and Rochester, he now has the number one comedy show in America. All over the country, people think about him, too, every Sunday night. Hear the Jack Benny Show with Claude Rains as Jack's special guest next Sunday on all these same CBS network stations. And now, back to yours truly, Johnny Dollar. The men with the guns, described from left to right, were a fat man with three chins and a bald dome... And with him, a punk with a sneer and arms that were too long for the rest of them. They gun muzzled me into a chair and started making anything but sense. Mm. Very well, Sandra, my dear. <clears throat> we are at last face to face with the mysterious stranger, Johnny Dollar. Now, well, don't kill the suspense and tell me why. He knows why. He came to the Wardlow Bar. He knew about Frank Moore and he was looking for the other one, Harrison. That is why I phoned you. Well, <clears throat> it would seem then that this unfortunate chain of events is... Needing the final link. Yeah, this guy uses his head better than Harrison did. Well, Della? I'm using my head right now. Splendid, splendid. So doing, you may well prevent Harrison's death as well as your own. Oh, well, that's better than nothing. But uh, is that all you can offer? Skip the bargaining, Russ Line. Takes too much time. Quiet, Corgi. The times when money is cheaper than the results of your kind of blind violence. Well, Della, you do have a price. Take a tip from my last name. Start bidding. I tell you, you're not Rosalind. You aren't sure he knows where it is. He must know. He was looking for Harrison. They both know. You'll be quiet, both of you. Five hundred pounds English dollar. Where is it? At times like this, I keep my mouth shut and my ears open. Seven hundred and fifty. Surely, dollar, since you've entered the situation at such a late date, that is profit enough. Oh, well, I'm a man of expensive tastes. I've always aspired to such things as $200 cigarette lighters. Go ahead. Keep spitting out that wise talk and you'll be spitting out teeth. Well, how'd you like to go swimming with your hands and feet tied? I could bite my tongue. <clears throat> uh, not, not just yet, Corgi, my boy. <clears throat> this man is worthless, dead. Uh, perhaps, Dolly, we can induce you to talk in much the same way as we could prepare a parrot by <clears throat> slitting the tongue. You know, Rosalind, your mother must have been scared by Sidney Greenstreet. Hey, you... Either this guy is nuts or he doesn't know anything. What I know would fill a police blotter. Okay. You know nothing of psychology, my boy. What this man is attempting to pass off as a show of bravery is based purely on the knowledge that he is, momentarily at least, of some considerable value to us alive. Now, Dollar, be careful. Before you make your final decision, bear in mind you've heard our final offer. Now, sir, what should it be? Oh, the squirrel, the squirrel said to the little girl when she asked him what he wanted for Christmas, nuts. Very well, Nella. Corgi. Thanks. I finally came to in the dark, trussed up like a turkey, and lay there trying to figure it out. Obviously, the two rude dudes thought I knew something I didn't know. But what I did know was that finding Harrison had turned into a big, fat headache. Also, that I had accomplished exactly nothing towards speeding the SS Shanghai Wayfarer over the bounding main. While I was comforting myself by repeating over and over that old insurance company soother, never say die, I discovered I wasn't alone. Hello. Huh? You, who are you? Well, you were here first, you tell me. Well, my name is Harrison. Harrison? Yes, who are you? I'm Johnny Dollar. I was sent out here by the Oriental West Cargo Bonding Company. Oriental West? Yes, I was supposed to do what you couldn't get done. And look at me now. Getting hit over the head and dumped in here must be par for the course. How long have you been here, and why? I've been driving myself crazy trying to figure that out. Well, this little guest house, wherever we are, must only have one set of proprietors. I can tell you who they are, at least by the names they're using tonight. Rosalind and Corgi. They offered me 750 English pounds to tell them where something called it was. What is it? Well, it's a package. What's in it, I don't know. It belonged to the chief engineer of the Shanghai Wayfarer, Frank Moore. He was helping me try to get the ship on its way, and I, I owed him a favor. He asked me to drop this package at a bar. The, the, the Wardlow bar, yeah, go ahead. That's right. I was supposed to give it to a girl named Chandra. She wasn't there, so I got her address and went out to her place. You mean that package is at Chandra's house? Yes. When I got out there, the Chinese maid let me in. I, I waited as long as I could, and then rather than leave what might be a valuable package just lying around loose, I, I put it into the bottom drawer of a dresser and left. Oh, great. For such things, I go around laying down my life. Well, it's obvious that these men will stop at nothing to get their hands on that package. 
Well, when they asked you where it was, why didn't you tell them? Then neither one of us would be here. What's more, I'm beginning to think the sooner they get the package, the sooner our ship sails. Frank Moore had been a good friend to me. He wanted Chandra to have it, and I, I couldn't just turn it over to those two. Well, I've got some news for you. And this should make you really unhappy. Those two happen to be in business with Chandra. Huh? They're all on the same team. She's one of them. What an idiot I've been. Uh, well, here we are, all roped up. You know, for a pair of guys who came out here to speed a shipload of raw tin on its way, we're doing just dandy. We're lucky if we get out of this thing alive. Offhand, I'd say our host probably murdered Frank Moore trying to get that package. Maybe we're next. Uh-oh. Maybe right now. A beam from a powerful flashlight stabbed us in the eyes. The sudden change from too much dark to too much light kept us blinded. Well, look who's here. At least the voice behind the glare wasn't Rosalind's and it wasn't Corgi's. But it was a familiar voice, one I'd heard and heard lately. He walked in on us, the flash in one hand, and in the other, a knife with a six-inch blade. At first, I wondered whether it was the one that had been buried in Frank Moore's back. And then I remembered where I'd seen it before. The man bending over us was the burly gangway watch from the Shanghai Wafer. And you told me to watch out for pirates. Well, this situation is getting a little overcrowded. I didn't think there was room for any more. What do you want? You know what I want, Dollar. The same thing Rosalind and Corgi are ripping your hotel room apart for right now. Now, don't tell me you're looking for it, too. Two things I know about that package, mister. The name is Rourke. Okay, Rourke. One thing I know is that it's dangerous company. The other is I want no part of it. The only thing I'm interested in is getting the Shanghai Wayfarer out of port. It won't be hard once I get that package. Where is it, Dollar? Uh, I'll trade the answer to that question for a little freedom. Okay, hold still. Uh, Thanks. Harrison's next. I want him with us in case he's lying. All right. Okay, Harrison, roll over. Hey, you! When Rourke bent over Harrison, I dropped kicked the flashlight out of his hand, ran across the darkened room, through the open door, and kept on running. Sometimes the long way around is the shortest way home, so I headed for Chandra's house. I not only had some getting even to do, but I had some curiosity to satisfy. Somehow the Shanghai Wayfarer's failure to sail on schedule was tied up with a mysterious package. But how? Why? I decided I'd earn the right to see what was in that package. Johnny! I didn't want you to be lonely. I heard your playmates are over making themselves at home in my room. So I thought you and I could have a little chat. Maybe I've got a surprise for you. What, Johnny? I think I know where that package is. Johnny, you gave that package. We both don't worry for the rest of our lives. But we must hurry before Roslyn and Corgi come back. We go now. Okay, where's your bedroom? Johnny, what do you mean? Now, oh, come on, where is it? Come, I'll show you. No! It cannot be. It's not the one, yeah. no. And it's been here all the time. And now while I open this thing, you can go and have yourself a nervous breakdown. <laughs> Say, this is more fun than unwrapping Christmas presents. And now I take off the cover. Wow. Now I know how the winner feels on Hit the Jackpot. The package was paper all the way through. Brown wrapping on the outside and green spending on the inside. Big bundles of fresh, clean American 20s. Thousands of the same kind of bills that the Singapore police had found in the late Frank Moore's wallet. It would have taken half a day to count it, and I'd wasted too much time already. There'll be no good to you without me, Johnny. You have to know how to get rid of them. Oh, counterfeit, huh? Yes. They are made in China. Frank Moore brought them from Shanghai to Roslyn to take to the States, but Roslyn was not here in Singapore. He was late, so Frank had to make some accidents happen to his ship to keep it from sailing. But then he changed his mind. He decided he would give the money himself. But Roslyn caught up with him. I see. He was sending them to you by way of Harrison, just before he was knifed by Roslyn, huh? Who talked him into that? You, by any chance? You and I could be very rich, Johnny. You never give up, do you? There's $500,000 there. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I should buy about 50 years in jail. I'm taking this down to customs and you're with it. No, I do not think you do. Uh-huh. Time to play another visiting team. Come on, beautiful. I don't want you in the way. She drove me out of the... I grabbed her, lashed her wrist with a cork in the package, and since she liked money so much, 
I stuffed her mouth with a fistful of those troublesome $20 bills. I locked her and the rest of the loot into a closet and dashed into the other room looking for a weapon. And then I remembered that Louisville slugger from the U.S. Marines. I was glad they'd landed. I grabbed it off the wall, got a toehold in the carpet on the left side of that door, wrapped my fingers around the bat, swung it on the back of my shoulder, and waited. Thunder. Thunder, my dear. We just came out. Two outs and one to go. Go! Go! Three outs, and the side is retired. What a ball game. Now, first, I take your guns. And now we sit and wait for you to wake up. I'll take over from here on in, Dollar. Huh? Oh, I don't know about that, Rourke. I happen to be the guy who has the gun. Oh? Well, here. Take a look at this. What's in your wallet that I want to look at? More hot 20s? I'm not taking my eyes off you, Rourke. Okay, I'll turn around with my hands up and then you can look at it. Okay, fair enough. But if you so much as move, I'll start shooting. That's the deal. Oh, it's a fine time to learn this. Are you satisfied? John Joseph Rourke, U.S. Treasury Department. Come on in. I'm sorry I couldn't come out into the open before, Dollar, but I was too close to the payoff of this case to take any chances. Well, you know, I'm beginning to think that just being in this town is taking chances. That counterfeit's been funneling through this port on its way from China for months. We had more staked out for a long time, but this is the first shot we had at the top. That's him lying there on the floor, Ross. Now I've got him. Oh, your pal Harrison told me where I can find the only other thing I need, that package of hot money in the dresser drawer. Oh, it's now moved into the bedroom closet. Along with a package of hot woman. Well, then, Dollar, it looks like my job out here is just about done. Yeah, I guess so. Hey, wait a minute. Hmm? You're from the Treasury Department. Yes? Well, then, after you get all these birds into their cages, how about helping me make out my income tax? <laughs> Expense account, item six. Hotel bill, one night in Singapore, five dollars. Item seven... One new outfit, replacing mine, which was ruined in course of taking midnight dip in Singapore River, $200. Item eight, $20. Bar checks for cheering up one William Harrison, your expediter, whose innocence had him running errands for the man who was holding up the departure of your ship. Item nine, $375. Spent while killing time until the departure of my plane back to the States. After the Shanghai Wayfarer finally sailed. You see, this time, I had four hours on my hands instead of the two you allowed me in San Francisco. Expense account total, $1,407. Signed, yours, uh, truly, Johnny Dollar. <laughs> In just a moment, we'll tell you about next week's Johnny Dollar Adventure. But first, for more exciting drama in the mystery and adventure line, remember CBS two thrill-packed Saturday night shows, The Adventures of Philip Marlowe and Gangbusters. Be sure to hear Philip Marlowe and Gangbusters tomorrow night on most of these same CBS network stations. Next week, CBS will take you adventuring with Johnny Dollar, hitting the hot spots in Palm Beach and New Orleans with the star of Hades, Diamond, on a trip all points south. Charles Russell plays the role of Johnny. Our music is composed and conducted by Mark Warno. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, is written by Paul Dudley and Gil Dowd and is produced and directed by Richard Sandville for CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Welcome back. Well, this is... Um... Uh, Johnny Dollars, his first of three trips to Singapore, um, and I, I thought a pretty inter a pretty interesting case. Um, uh, and uh, I'm not sure, given his expense reporting habits, that uh, showing his tax returns to somebody and how he was planning to fill them out, showing them to somebody from the Treasury Department, I'm not sure that'd be a great idea. Uh, but another good episode from Charles uh, from Charles Russell. All right, we got a few more comments. Um, Chris uh, Chris uh, writes in. 
Uh, thanks for a great podcast each day now. I love the idea of five to Texas a week. Glad you're doing it. And, uh, and, uh, uh, I got one, um, uh, from Perth in Western Australia, which is, uh, actually a pretty, uh, significant place for downloads of the show. Um, and wondering what happened with Let George Do It. We had a little bit of an issue in the morning. I think everybody, uh, should have been able to get that episode. And uh, if, if you haven't, just feel free to go to iTunes or download it off greatdetectives.net. All right, and uh, we have, uh, in addition to comments on Podcast Alley, some comments on um, uh, some comments over on iTunes. Uh, let's see here. Uh, we got this from Swim Guy. I have loved Adam's Dragnet podcast for a long time, and I love this new podcast. There's other podcasts out there in this genre, but none of the hosts will go to the links Adam will to find all of the episodes, and some of them are simply at ran random. Thanks, Adam. Keep up the great work. And thank you for the comment, Swim Guy. Um, and uh, got this from... Um, Madrigal, who wrote uh, that we needed to speed up our openings a little bit, and we succeeded in doing that in the first two weeks. First time, I think we may have run a little long uh, this first episode, but that's okay. But Madrigal writes, I've really been enjoying each of the Daily Detective podcasts. Now that your initial news-packed intro to the whole program is in the past, you're finding a much better balance between info, ads, and discussion in your opening remarks. With with Dragnet, I find I am ready for a new episode before the week is half over. Unfortunately, the opposite is true with your new shows. Because I often start with these new detective shows fairly late in the evening, I sometimes fall asleep before they are over. Then, with a brand new podcast coming with each new day, I'm beginning to get a little behind in my listening. Um, and uh, uh, that's, that's why we're only doing five episodes a week. That way, people have got two days where there's not a show. Except this week, where there's only going to be one day. Uh, don't worry about it, though. I'm not complaining. Each show uh, doesn't take up much space, and there will certainly come a long car trip during which I can listen to three or four shows. Um, by the way, will your Sherlock Holmes podcast include the Rathbone Bruce shows? Uh, I hope so. Uh, you've got to love those opening ads for Wine and Such by a present-day Dr. Watson. Um, well, you've got to hear a little bit of that with uh, G. Washington Coffee. Um, but actually, the, the first episode, and we are definitely doing the Rathbone Bruce uh, episode, starting in uh, towards the middle of December. The first episodes we have are actually uh, sponsored by a company selling quinine for cold relief. Um, and uh, Dr. Watson is, um, of course, assisting in, uh, in the selling a little bit but not as much as he does for G. Washington Coffee, because coffee versus quinine, no con um, contest. Anyway, thanks for bringing this fun and uh, family-friendly entertainment into our homes. Well, thank you, and thanks so much for everybody's comments. Much appreciated, as always. Um, and uh, so that will uh, wrap up uh, this week's episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. Uh, we will be back with another week of shows, starting with Box 13, as always. And uh, and we'll begin to share some uh, aff uh, affiliate ads starting on next week's uh, Johnny Dollar. So, just letting you know in advance. Uh, but for now, thanks so much for everybody to listen for listening. From Boise, Idaho, this is your host, Adam Graham, signing off. <laughs>